All right, welcome everybody to our March work session meeting. Pursuant to board policy 1B.5, all meetings of the Salisbury Township School District are audio and video recorded. And I'd also like to let the public know that uh, this past Saturday, February 26th, the board had a uh, half day retreat and uh, training session. Can a uh, roll call? Mr. DeFrank? Here. Mr. Freeze? Here. Mrs. Glenister? Here. Mr. Ganahl? Here. Mrs. Klinger? Here. Mr. Cuzo? Mrs. McKelvey? Here. Oh, he's here. here. Sorry. Mrs. Here. McKelvey? Here. Mrs. Nemitz? Here. And Mr. Spinner? Here. I have all nine in attendance. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so now it is time for citizens' comments. We, um, you'll notice in this meeting and in our next regular board meeting, we made some changes to the uh, just the procedural aspect of the citizens' comments. For this meeting, we've moved it from the end of the meeting to the beginning of the meeting. So I'm not seeing any citizens present to comment. <laughs> so we will move past that item. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to our Curriculum and Technology Chair, Mrs. Klinger. Good evening. Um, tonight, we have three things on our agenda for Curriculum and Technology. The first one is the K-5 to ELA recommendation, which will be Mrs. Pauling, Mr. Brem, Mrs. Zellner, and Mrs. Stokes, I don't see her. Okay. Okay. Well, Mrs. Stokes should be here, but I just talked to her a little while ago, but so hopefully she'll be okay. here. Okay. Okay. I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, good evening. Um, so we've been on a journey to look at our ELA program over the past year. We actually started last um, fe late February, early March in um, seeding the idea and then looking and pursuing um, what was out there. Um, the reason... Yeah, maybe, no, that's okay. I got distracted. I thought Sarah did something. <laughs> <laughs> You're moving closer. I'm like, oh, <laughs> makes total sense. Um, so our current status is that we have a core resource. It's an anthology that was adopted somewhere around 2009, by the best of recollection. Uh, it is not. Uh, the State Board of Pennsylvania adopted new standards for ELA uh, directly after, which is you know exactly exactly how things work sometimes, unfortunately. So our current resource is not aligned to our current expectations. And over the years, we've added a number of different um, supplemental programs and things like, for example, increased the rigor of writing and um, we've added a structured phonics program. Um, so that right now, this is like the shared reading portion uh, of, the, um, of the reading block. Um, we have then, they revised new reading standards again uh, with, um, well, so, sorry, the Co Common Core was in 2010, and then PA Core adopted in 2014. So we've had new expectations for a while, and we've tried to make the current resource we have work. Um, so what we did is we took a year and we evaluated all the options. Uh, we looked at independent reviews. Um, Ed Reports is an independent organization that looks at curriculum. Uh, curriculum Matters is another organization that's really into um, looking at high quality um, products. Um, early in this adoption with changing standards, publishers were sort of known for putting a PA core sticker on the front of it, but it not really not really redesigning the, the material. So more current resources have been designed with the standards in mind as opposed to, you know, kind of shuffling things in the deck, so to speak. Um, so we've done a lot of research. Uh, we've listened to presentations. I interviewed multiple districts um, across the state of Pennsylvania. Um, we've listened to podcasts. We've gone to webinars. Um, uh, we've attended some professional development, both formal and informal, and we've piloted in classrooms and observed with teachers. Uh, we've surveyed teachers, and we've really dug deeply into the research on what is currently understood about this, the science of teaching, of reading, um, and have really kind of gained a lot of insight into what would be best for, for students. 
Um, what we've come to understand are good metrics for us to look for a core reading program is something that's comprehensive and has structured phonics. Um, phonics for a while was sort of a bad word <laughs> in education, thinking that if we just gave kids books, they would learn to love books. But indeed, there is that, that works for a very small number of kids. Most kids need structured phonics, and a small portion of kids need even more time and even more attention to learn how to read. Reading is not a natural process. Reading, talk, learning to talk is a natural process, but moving from speech to print is not a natural process. So what we're actually doing is changing the neurology of our brain and how it works. So really our teachers are doing brain science, every ner, neurosurgery every day in their classrooms. Um, the other thing that we've learned over the last decade or so is that how important background knowledge is, vocabulary is. We focused a lot on the mechanics of reading and putting books with kids, but if kids don't have background knowledge in a subject, they actually um, ha are poorer readers. Um, and when kids have a lot of background knowledge, they're more like high-performing readers. So we want kids to have something to say <laughs> and have background knowledge, not just be able to decode the words. Um, we want an integrated writing component. Um, our, our preference is for authentic texts. Uh, and for the upper grades, that means whole novels, like the, the books, getting books in kids' hand. I'm an avid reader, and I used to feel frustrated in school, and maybe some of you did as well, when you read a portion of a book, and then, oh, on to another story, right? Uh, and one of the things we've seen, I guess maybe I'm giving it away, is just how excited kids get about a really good book and a really good story. Um, you know, we're also wanting in, engaging instructional routines. We want things that kids get getting up out of their chair, talking about books and talking about what they're reading. Um, and of course, we want PD and teachers want something that's user friendly or at least manageable for them on their end. Um, we want implementation support and cost effective and sustainable materials. So this was sort of an iterative process. The more we learned, the more we refined, and the more we, we went forward. Um, we had narrowed it down or at the at, you know last year, maybe about May, to three of the programs. Two of them used core text, uh, you know, novels, books in kids' hand, and one of them used an anthology. <clears throat> we we settled on those for a variety of reasons, um, you know, looking at the phonics compo component, um, price, if there were technology elements, how that would work with our technology infrastructure. Um, how user-friendly were the teacher materials. Uh, and from there, we kind of focused in on a pilot um, with wit and wisdom. So um, Zach is just going to, our teacher who piloted in kindergarten is not able to be with us tonight. I think she's at a training for girls on the run or something, something else for the district. Um, so uh, Zach's going to take um, her slide. So the information that she shared with Kelly and I is that this builds on our current uh, phonics program. So we've already implemented some things like Hagerty and Foundations in our primary grades, and this pairs really well with, with those programs that we're, we're using. Um, it also builds on background knowledge and vocabulary like uh, Kelly had shared with you all as well. And if you take a look at those that picture, especially the one where the students are seated on the carpet squares, you'll see every one of those students' heads are buried into the book um, that they're, they're reading. And that's a kindergarten classroom, so pretty, pretty impressive. You'll also see some of the writing examples that the students are, are sharing there. So they're engaged. Um, they're interested in these texts that we're using um, specifically with this program. And that they are authentic and individual. So our students are is already in kindergarten are learning to respond orally um, and in writing to, to what they're reading in this program. Um, so these reading and writing modules are carried on throughout uh, each of the grade levels as well, as well, where writing is embedded within the, the ELA curriculum. And Mrs. Zellner is with us from second grade. Hi. Um, so a lot of what you heard from kindergarten and what Kelly said, um, Oh. Yeah, so people can hear you on watching online. He turned it off. He wants to be green. You got to make sure you hit the button there, it'll turn green. Perfect. There you go. Um, so it does build on our existing phonics um, program that we use, and that is such an important piece of it because we feel that 
the kids are successful in using um, the foundation's curriculum. Um, again, it's very engaging. The kids are really involved, and you could see in the pictures there, they love the routines, they work together. The collaboration is amazing. Like the discussions that are happening um, between these, these kids is just unbelievable. Um, the vocabulary is very rich and they are learning from that and that is building their background knowledge and what they're able to carry over to other areas is, is really impressive. Um, and again, they, they, it's been said, but the routines that they're developed early on and they're learning these listening, speaking routines, um, how to collaborate through Socratic seminars and, and paired discussion and gallery walks. And I added a video in there and you, you'll, if you play it um, when you have time, you could see it's about three and a half minutes, but it's the kids feedback on it. It's unscripted. I just pulled them aside and said, what do you like about wit and wisdom? And the thing that really impressed me was every kid I pulled from different classrooms had something different to say about the program. It wasn't the same thing. Some talked about the vocabulary fairs <clears throat> that we do. Some talked about the gallery walk. You could see the one boy in the picture. We put the text pictures around the room and they comment and they build on um, comments that kids put previously and they're like, oh, I saw they commented on that and I'm going to add to this or I'm going to answer their question in their next response. So um, it's just really neat to see that engagement going on. Um, and they talked about the, how the art is brought into it and we could really, um, the, the nature, they love the nature part because we did a lot on leaves and um, just they all commented on something different. So it's really neat to listen to that video and just hear their perspective. And some of them will give you, you'll see in the video, the whole rundown about how leaves change colors. Because they know that <laughs> inside and out. They're using words you're like, wow, this seven or eight year old is, is using is, is unreal. Um, and it's also really important, I think, because I have a very diverse classroom. I have um, eight kids who um, have a learning disability. I have three gifted kids. And it's really interesting to see how they work together. It feels, it makes the kids with learning disabilities feel successful. They're able to contribute so much during this time. They have learned instead of doing the writing we have in the past where this is integrated, they have the background knowledge. It's not them sitting there for 20 minutes. What am I going to write about? I don't know what to write about. It's, they know it. They have the vocabulary. They're using our vocabulary wall and they're, they're writing so much. And it's really neat. They have those ideas and they could really expand on that. Um, and just how they can discuss the discussion part of it. They're feeling successful. So maybe they can't really do a lot of the reading, but <coughs> the learning is just, it's building on that knowledge and then they are able to start to read. Um, and it's, it's really good to see. And in the same sense, the kids who are in the gifted aren't bored with it. They're, very, they're still challenged too. And it's so funny to see they pair up with kids of different levels, like, because they sometimes get to pick their partner and they'll go, you know, right to a lower level um, learner and, and work with them. And they like go through the book and they discuss and they help each other. And um, they just all feel successful and challenged. And I think that's just a really important piece of it. Thanks. Thanks, Kristen. And uh, Mrs. Stokes is here from fourth grade. Good evening. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so the entire fourth grade team chose to pilot this together. So we've had a great year. Um, we focused in fourth grade so far on two essential questions. The first one is what makes a great heart literally and figuratively? And to that end, we read um, Love That Dog, a novel. We read a lot of poetry and got to perform poetry. Um, we had a... Um, exciting lab outside with goat hearts, sheep hearts, and deer hearts. The kids read the scientific text, the circulatory story. So just like Kristen's kids can tell you all about the leaves, fourth graders can tell you all about the circulatory system. Um, so there, we were really um, impressed with that very first module. Our second module was how a challenging setting or a challenging physical environment can change a person. And for these kids, this is, this is perfect for reflecting on the last two years and what they've had to endure. 
um, this unit re will really give them a chance to reflect and, and also learn from the story of Brian and Hatchet, which you typically hear of in most districts as a middle grade le uh, level um, text. And we're reading it in fourth grade. And just like Kristen said, it's, you know, with all levels of kids, I happen to have the, the class with um, the ELL students. Um, and with, the, with that teacher's support, with previewing vocab words and um, sharing some context before we read the text, the students are able to be successful with this curriculum. Um, like you said, amazing vocabulary. They've learned uh, through our arts and, and science and also through history, great biographies. They've learned about artistic <coughs> techniques like chiaroscuro. They've learned architectural terms like cantilever. I mean, it's just, it's so impressive if, um, if you take a look at the curriculum. Um, we also share, you know, a lot of the same instructional routines. So you can see there are students doing gallery walks. You can see a Socratic seminar in the bottom right corner. You can see them teaming, working on writing and peer review. Um, so because of the, the academic rigor, as well as these great engagement strategies, the fourth grade team um, does support moving forward. I had the opportunity to stop by last week and um, happened to ask some of the kids, like at fourth, it was in fourth grade, I asked them, so how, you know, how's the book? I literally had kids like swarming and they were literally jumping out of their skin to tell me that they love this book. And, and um, their teachers were like, well, why do you like it? Or what do you like about it? And they were like, it is so exciting. I just don't know how every chapter is going to end and what is Brian going to do? <laughs> and um, they have had kids who didn't want They got, somebody got called down to um, the office for something, like forgot something. Was that you, Shannon? Um, they forgot something or they needed needed to do something like, well, do I have to go now? Like, I don't want to miss class. And I think that's something we don't want to overlook. One of the pieces that I think is so passionate about this is that really PSSA scores, all of that is important and it matters. But at the end of the day, what's really important is that kids learn to love books and have authors they like and books that they love and memories that they're making. And so I feel like this this is building all of that for kids and what we've seen so far. Um, so it, you know, it's been, it's been going very well. Um, the benefits would be that it does build, we've, we've made a significant investment in our phonics program. It's through Wilson reading, which is um, rather um, like the Cadillac of, <laughs> of, of, you know, in, in terms of phonics and, uh, We've trained teachers for it and bought materials, and they feel comfortable and confident in that. We didn't know. I mean, honestly, before we did the independent review of, I didn't, I didn't know when Wisdom existed. It's not from one of the big three publishers, so we didn't even know that was an option when we started looking. So that caught our eye immediately as something to investigate. Um, I didn't know that the research was so heavy in having a really knowledge building curriculum, but it but it does. And in fact, the independent reviews point that out over and over again. Um, the strong writing component, the more kids know about something, the more they can write about it. So that's a big piece. And text-dependent analysis. So for th fourth grade through eighth grade, text-dependent analysis is 20% of the, 25% of the PSSA. And um, this program is asking kids constantly to read closely, to cite evidence. Um, they're build from, from the early grade grades, right? Where maybe we wouldn't really touch on that till maybe third or fourth grade or fifth grade. Now we're doing this much earlier, but in an engaging way so it doesn't feel stale, you know. Um, it's, it's full books, which we feel like, you know, turn to page 33 or a book, right? Like what's going to get us more excited? So that's the advantage there. Um, there are engaging routines. Some of the other programs we looked at had turn and talk to your neighbor. Our kids are acting things out, running discussions and Socratic seminars and doing gallery walks. And the kids actually say words like, yes, I really like the gallery walk, <laughs> which is super cool. Um, because we've already made a significant investment in the phonics portion, um, this comes out, even though it's a lot of books, 
it comes out as pretty cost effective, which I'll show you in a moment. And we, there are other options that are open source that we could investigate, but they don't necessarily have access to the professional development and implementation support. So this is sort of like that middle ground, like they've been around a while. They've been around like about 12, 13 years. So they actually have monthly professional development sessions. So beyond our rollout, teachers, as they join our staff, we have access to professional development um, for for, for the teachers. No other publisher we looked at had that organized framework for teachers to pursue learning. Um, it would be bringing somebody in and everybody's got to be ready to learn at the same time. So we feel like it's really more just in time kind of professional development. Um, it's modular in structure. So there's four modules per grade level um, and then there's the phonics component. Uh, and there's decodable readers. And if one part doesn't work for us at some point, because I've been around long enough in education to know that today I am telling you what I think and the research tells me is the best way to teach reading. In another five years, if that long, something else, we'll learn something else and may want to make a revision. Because it's modular, we can replace the module or replace the phonics compo component without really kind of letting everything go go stale, you know, um, with with it. So in that sense, I feel like it's it's pretty sustainable. Um, most of the time we have funding for children's books. There's lots of funding for children's books, you know, lots of different funding sources for children's books. There's not that many funding sources outside of the district um, budget for a big reading program, which is why we waited long. So I think that's a really important component. But nothing is without its drawbacks. So it would, it would, it, there is several drawbacks, including, um, you know, the teacher's edition, the teachers really have a wish list that it would be a little more user friendly, you know, um, but it's doable. But I think the biggest one and one we want to be transparent about, and I have tried to flag this for the board in the past, is that when you're using a full book, um, one of the reasons why publishers have used anthologies in the past because they can grab a portion that's going to be nobody's going to have a question about, right? It's going to be a pretty, um, um, a, 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 yeah, a pub, it's going to be something that's not going to be cause any raised eyebrows. I guess I'll, I'll say it, nothing objectionable about it. When you're using a full book. There are times when there could be a word, a phrase, a sentence, a paragraph, a page of something that is objectionable to someone at some time. Um, I have contacted multiple other districts to ask, has this been an issue? Everyone has told me, and I contacted about five in Pennsylvania. I contacted Abington Heights, um, Quakertown, um, Wayland, Wayne Highlands, uh, Avonworth School District. Is there another one? I don't know. Off the top of my head, I can't think. Oh, Penn's Manor. Penn's Manor was another one. Everyone said that they've had zero to very few concerns from parents or community members. And um, if they have had a religious exemption, they've handled that according to their policy. Um, and they that really talking with parents and showing them how a book is used and what the essential question is, most times they're able to resolve it at, at that level. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, that as Shannon said, I taught, I taught Hatchet in fifth grade when I taught students. It's now at an earlier age. So um, here, um, Carol is saying she taught it in sixth. So, you know, some of the content, the standards require us to teach complex text. That's what the standards require. And what the research shows is that the, when kids already know how to read, so they're not beginning readers, they need complex text. They need to be challenged with a variety of types of text, including complex text, to stretch their, their reading skills. That's where the most growth is going to be. Complex text means there's complex characters, complex situations, complex dialogue, complex settings, you know, complex plots, um, and and some of which reflects the human experience. Um, and so that is one of the things that we have to be transparent about is that that is that is how this curriculum is designed. Um, Teachers are media, I mean, the teachers, and we've been very upfront about this, and the reason why we took so long in the pilot is we wanted to be sure, because we've done two modules, or we're almost through the second module um, with fourth grade, we just wanted to be sure that that was something 
we could navigate and we felt comfortable with. I didn't want to put the teachers in a position where they're not comfortable. Um, we, we do feel like we're comfortable. The teachers are mediating things. When things have come up, when you look in the teacher's guide, they're like, oh, we're not even reading that. You know, we're, we're looking at this, and we've been able to manage it um, well so far. Um, in addition, I had conversations with Great Minds, uh, which is the publisher for this curriculum, and there are, they are publishing um, new texts and tasks that could be used for replacement activities. Um, if, a student is, if a student is a religious exemption, or we could choose to replace it because the module doesn't, you know, something in the module doesn't work for us, or we just feel like that would be better. Um, they also, right now, they haven't developed them yet. They may get into this and decide, oh, that's a better choice, right? So we want to pick the best choice, obviously, for us. But it's nice to know that the teachers, um, if we were, if the board were to move forward with this recommendation, that that's something that we would have um, to add that we didn't have this year. That that's something we would have moving forward. Um, so some of the next steps that would take place, um, given the board's approval of wit and wisdom, would be communication with parents, of course, as far as the, the change in the ELA curriculum at the elementary level. Uh, professional development for all staff, that includes staff that have already completed the pilot as well, and leveraging their experiences with the staff that, that haven't piloted this, this program. They have a lot of insight to offer us. We've been asking them during collaborative team meetings for their input and, and making adjustments. Um, their experiences are going to help us in developing a schedule um, and staffing that's appropriate to support the, the ELA curriculum at the elementary level as well. So we're gonna have to make some adjustments to our, our current schedule uh, to make sure that there's adequate time to deliver um, instruction effectively. We have to approach the, the conversation of assessments and, and report cards and what that looks like and how does that impact, uh, impact things. The elementary school does have a standards-based report card, but we want to make sure that there's alignment based on each of the trimesters um, in meeting those standards to make sure that uh, across the board in K through 4, K through 5, that um, there's alignment there. We have to take a look at small group instruction and differentiation. So. Uh, Mrs. Zellner and Mrs. Stokes had shared that they've um, experienced success with students in their in their classes, whether they be English language learners or students that are receiving special education services. However, we do realize that there may be students that may not experience success um, with this program and then determining um, what alternative curriculums we may utilize with those students or supplemental curriculums to assist them in being successful with this program. Um, we're also considering audio books for some of the students that have a gap between their reading level and because we still want to be develop their background knowledge as kids develop s skills as readers, we want them to feel like we want them to have the same background knowledge that all of our other students are. So we're we're kind of exploring a couple of different options, and we'll probably land on different things for different kids um, uh, if we move forward. Um, so the idea would be that. Um, if the board were to move forward, uh, some teachers are very interested in knowing, teachers want to know what we're doing next year. <laughs> they, want, they don't want to be surprised. Um, they would like opportunities to wrap their head around it, maybe even get some books and some materials in advance to even dabble in this spring uh, after PSSAs are over and, and um, would then move forward with full implementation for, for next year. Um, in terms of costs, um, so before I talk to Kristen tonight, <laughs> uh, Kristen was, I, I had only budgeted here for consumables for fourth and fifth grade because I thought that was the feedback from the staff, but I have new feedback tonight. So we may, we may need to be looking at consumables for um, multiple grade levels and I'll have to go back. That's why these kind of meetings are helpful as you kind of zero in on that. Um, so most, if you look at the, Charlie, oh yes. Can you define consumables? Oh, sorry, workbooks or things that kids use during the year in instruction and then they need to be replaced for the next year. And Kristen has an example of one and they, and they brought some books too if people wanna look at some of the books kids have used so far. Um, so you'll notice here that the core texts are the bulk of the costs, right? Like it's uh, a lot of the cost is um, 
for the for the quote from Great Minds, it's books, um, which we can then we would have to also budget, uh, and I'm not sure how much, but books will get bent, lost, ripped, you know, fine legs. <laughs> so we'll have to do some replacement. Um, but um, you know, the the total cost. Oh, it's, teachers would like some supplemental materials. There's some PowerPoints, posters, vocabulary wall materials, um, independent reading books which align to the module so that kids are practicing these skills on their own, uh, and then professional development um, is a cost as well. Um, so those are our, our costs, which I will revise based on new information. <laughs> and I guess any any questions from the board right now as you or any questions for our teachers or... Mr. Bram? How many, how many teachers piloted the program? Uh, we had one in kindergarten, three or three in, in um, three in third, or no, three in second grade. I should just let Kristen take this. <laughs> and then one in fifth grade. And everybody was positive about it? So like um, everybody was positive about it. We had one teacher that started in second grade and opted not to continue, but we also didn't have an opportunity to meet and work through her concerns. It was one of those things where, like, the days we met, she wasn't there. So I'd like to think we would have been able to mediate, you know, and work through it, but there wasn't that opportunity. Um, but yes, uh, it's pretty... We're were, uh, and we also had two special ed teachers involved in the pilot. So we have some feedback about, you know, where where we could think differently about some of those pieces too. Yeah, man, you guys sound so excited about it. It's fun to hear. You know, <laughs> like to have that much excitement. Um, so you've budgeted, you said. For Just a reminder to use the microphones because people at home can't hear. Um, you said that you've budgeted for fourth and fifth grade, but you need to revise based on feedback. So this is going to be two through five, K through five? K through five. K through five. Okay. I just want and it's just the consumables that were, uh, the other, uh, I had misunderstood, I guess the teachers had said they were looking for something else that they wanted to print. And I took that as, oh, you didn't want consumables. But indeed, Kristen has clarified, and, it was an and. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I heard or. <laughs> Kelly, is it, is it? Can we assume that the consumables will be similar price per grade? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you throw that quote back up there? Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. And we'd, we'd be using multiple grant funds. So we, yeah. we have budgeted um, ARP funds uh, to support um, learning loss, basically. And what we're saying is this is a way to accelerate some of those gaps. Um, we have Title I funds for the teacher materials. Our building budget, curriculum budget, would pay for consumables. So that's something that we budget for, um, you know, often like for math and things. Um, we have a, the, set, the ESSER set aside grant actually requires us to do professional development on the science of reading. So that it would fill that requirement um, on, on these pieces. And then we have Title II funds as well that we would use for professional development. Do you expect moving forward that there would be other grant funds to cover the consumables, the replacement of books, or is this going to be a budgetary item long term? Um, I, as long as we qualify to be a Title I school, we see Title I funds being able to supplement uh, children's books. Um, but it would also open us up to perhaps other grants that we could we could uh, look for and and find because it's pretty it's a pretty I don't know I don't know what to say it's not a very um, conflict you know there's no conflict over children's books <laughs> people want to give kids books so it's an easier sell I think than some other things so for the replacement Could I just ask a question no. Joe can go first oh, sorry it's, it's weird being not there but <laughs> could I just since I can't see any of the presentation. What is the outside of our, our current budget that would be the ask for 22-23? Say without the grants or Title I funds, what would the actual amount over what we currently budget for that curricular area? Um, so we're, we'd be the only thing that we would be looking at as a sustainable cost would be the consumables, which would be the workbooks for students. Um, we currently don't provide workbooks for our students because Storytown is... Well, it's 
they would not be helpful. <laughs> so we haven't budgeted for those, um, but we do have a um, curriculum budget and a, and a building budget that those, those items would be uh, purchased out of. I think what Joe's referring to is, the, so, no, 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 go. What? Oh, is that what you mean? Yeah. No, I, I'm not looking at this as an increase of budgetary item. Something we can sustain with our current budgets. And you're saying the initial outlay uh, 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 come from from the from the grants, correct? Yes. Did you ask any of the other schools how often they need to replace the course texts and books, and what that cost is per year? Because, like Storytown, I couldn't lose that book if I wanted to, right? <laughs> so, um, but I can, you know, or I could run it over with my car, and it would be fine. But like Hatchet, you know, a paperback book. It's it's not going to last nearly as long. It's not going to last from. It's not going to last 12, 12 yeah. years. No, it so, isn't going to. So, did you get any estimates from any of the other schools as to what those replacements are? You know, what, I did. Are? I didn't ask that question. I wonder if the teachers have an idea from at least your, any loss this year. That you so there hasn't been the the texts that are getting passed around. Those don't go home. So we either, some teachers collect them at the end of each class period just so they know where all 20 of them end up. <laughs> My kids, I have them labeled and they stay, in, they stay in the classroom, but the workbooks do go home and those are consumable anyway. So when you lose your workbook, we know it's yours and I can then make copies to replace that. Same thing for us. The kids use them, um, but they don't keep them in their desks. They, okay. they return them to you know, our library area. But I'm happy to follow up on that question to get an idea, so I, I, I can do that. We've also used, like, contact paper over, you know, what I'm, do you remember what I'm talking about, contact paper? Old school book covers, yeah. Old, and um, using that as a middle school teacher, that really protected books for a long time. Are there any other questions? I want to thank Kelly and the teachers and the principals because I really feel that you have done your homework on this. You've done everything you possibly could do. It seems like the teachers are excited. It seems like the reports that the kids are excited about this. It incorporates everything that we need. I was reading that uh, science of reading. It sounds like this program does all that. And, you know, it has the background knowledge, it also has the phonics, and it also has the writing, and it also touches on what we need for the core curriculum. Um, and I have been around a long time. I don't think I've ever seen so much work done before an adoption of a program as you have done on this one. So I don't think you've done this hastily. I think you've done it, uh, you had a plan, you implemented it, and I, I would feel good about giving the go-ahead for this when it comes, I think, in March. Um, so thank you very much, because you're not spending our money in haste or waste. So well, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Carol, for saying that. And I'd just like to thank the teachers. I mean, it's been a, diff a difficult school year on top of a difficult school year. And for them to say and raise their hand and say, yeah, you know, I'll make life harder. <laughs> I'll learn something entirely new and, and um, you know, go to extra meetings and professional development and spend, spend time at home, uh, you know, dedicating themselves to trying to give this a try and giving honest feedback and, you know, working through solutions, I do, I thank you very much and you and your colleagues for, for stepping up. Um, and I will say this, what, like, this is the highest quality solution I could provide to you at, and it is at a relatively lower, lower cost than other options that may not qualify for grant dollars. So we're really, ex I'm really excited. This has worked out so well. I, I, we didn't know how it was going to work out and I, just really grateful for the teachers to seeing it through. I'll echo that as well. Um, so we've also implemented a new math program as well. Um, and that was partially implemented virtually last school year. So this school year they're implementing the math program in person for the first time. And also we're willing to take on a pilot of an ELA program as well, which benefited us and being able to collect this information for everyone. So 
thank you to, to our teachers for, for doing that. Yeah, I'll say, um, like, I'm an avid reader myself, and as soon as I heard last year that this program was based, you know, on actual books, I was excited about it, and now that, you know, we're learning that it brings in more um, social studies content, more science content, like, I'm sold. I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks. I have one more quick question, and it just it occurred to me. Is there any concern um, about having one program over two different buildings? Like, is that ever run into any kind of roadblocks that you have fifth grade in one building and, and the rest of the students are over in, in in another building? I don't think it's an issue. I just want to, this is like the first time we're, since we're... I believe that's what's happening now with Zern. Am I correct? Math. Okay. Yeah, it hasn't it hasn't come up for us. I think it's nice that it gives that continuity. That's, yeah, I'm just making sure. As they head into, into the middle it's school. It's a nice step because... Yeah. Comfortable. I would say, I mean, overall, this is such a rigorous program. As a former middle school and high school English teacher, this is phenomenal what they're learning and, and what we're preparing them for, is especially as far as their writing skills. So, um, yeah, I have no, I think it will make them even better prepared for middle school. <laughs> I think part of our thinking was that a transition from one building to the other, if the routines and the you know, the modules will change, but if the routines, the learning routines are similar, that that will just only help um, with the transition to another building. And some of the districts I talked to didn't have a K-5 to or K-8 adoption, and when they didn't, they were looking to expand so that they did, so. Laura, I did love those Storytown books, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, with that, we'll move on to the uh, middle school update with Mrs. Pauling and Mr. Parliament and Mr. Sawicki. Oh, it's loading. <laughs> I don't know, it didn't load. Oh, we break it? Well, we, we broke it. <laughs> Too many Kelly did it. <laughs> we can maybe disconnect somehow. Just... I don't know if I can take it over. Hi. Okay. Yeah, it won't let me because it's already in use. Sorry. But if I shut it down, we're going to lose. No. Okay, oh. because it zooms here. Okay. So I should have. Yep, we'll have to restart it. Sorry for the delay. <clears throat> they want to talk about reading more. <laughs> oh, we got I it. Just Let me try. Reading to take as long as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, this is work. Why do we have an eagle as our picture? When? Is an eagle as your picture? It's not mine. I'm joking. <laughs> to be honest. Okay. Lynn's not going to let me touch the computer anymore. <laughs> it's all part of your plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Well done. Yeah, well done. <laughs> I know that trick well. So last month we, fe we talked about the elementary school and where they were and giving an update and we just thought we would feature the middle school this month. Um, again, we use FastBridge um, for our mid-year data. We, have, we also administer PSSAs and key, the Keystone Algebra exam, um, but we wanted to give you a more current picture of, of where we see students. Um, we adopted in the middle school for all the same reasons we did at the elementary school, uh, and, um, but we've only had one year. This is actually our second year, so it's, it's really the first time we're Last year wasn't a great <laughs> example of using data in that way. And I guess the only thing I wanted, to, I wanted to kind of preface before we dig into the data is it's a little different at the middle school. What we're finding is some of the reporting features that are so valuable at the elementary school aren't don't translate in the same way. Um, the reporting is still there, but the, the information that we're getting 
isn't maybe as sophisticated enough for the for the depth that middle school kids are. So at this point, this is what we have, and we're going to have to consider whether you know we'll give it we're going to give it again, and whether or not we get enough information to make this. So we don't quite have as much specificity as we were able to get with the elementary piece. So just putting that on the table so everybody knows that up front. So. And, and to that, so this is our first, our second year really using FastBridge at the middle school. I mean, I like, we like the idea. We're excited about it because of the launch. Can, can you please pull the microphone a little closer? How's that? Is that better? So much better. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, so we're excited about it because of the longitudinal data and, and being able to look at it and see how kids are, are growing from elementary school through eighth grade, which is the first time we really have that. Um, before this, we used the classroom diagnostic tools, which were um, provided through this, from the state. And there were some flaws in them. And we've used a bunch of different tools throughout the years, from Study Island to the CDTs. So um, this is the first uh, real year that we're digging into some of the data from FastBridge, like Kelly mentioned, to see whether or not um, it's providing us with the data that we have. And we found some benefit from it, but there are some things we're going to try differently moving forward to the spring assessment, too, to see if that, that makes any changes before, uh, moving forward. Um, to the math extent, so going through math and ELA and SEL, just like the elementary did um, last month, uh, math, you know, and learning loss uh, prior to the pandemic, you know, so we identified that we had some concerns related to our math data. So this isn't something that's that's due to the pandemic. This is something that we've identified for a few years now, and our math scores haven't been the greatest. Um, they've been below the state average for a few years. And there's, there's some reasons we believe for that. We've been trying a lot of different things uh, to you know, correct that. But one of the main components um, in looking at this and sitting down with Lynn and Kelly um, last year and analyzing some of our, um, our numbers, we feel is programming. So like as, as you mentioned, you heard this before, Zern and Eureka are being implemented for the second year now. Well, Eureka for the second year, uh, Zern is, is actually for the uh, first year in grades six through six and seven, because we haven't had the digital components. Um, but our data has been low, and we feel that like the curriculum that we've used, we've gone through a lot of several different you know curriculum transitions over the last few years, and it, it's been the data has been low since we transitioned to the PA core, and we've been using some outdated curriculum that hasn't been completely aligned to that, and trying to supplement and, and fill in the pieces as we go. Um, so this is the second year we're implementing Eureka Zern. Um, we've also looked at our schedules at the middle school and realized while our ELA scores were um, a little bit better than our math scores, we've been providing twice as much time in our schedule for ELA as we have for math. So in the past, we've had a five-period day and had two 45-minute classes of ELA for writing and reading and one 45-minute math. So we restructured our schedule over the last two years to make it a four core period and added 15 minutes additional, 60 minute periods of 15 minutes extra of math per day um, into the schedule. So looking at trying to balance it at a time. And just putting that in context, um, you know, middle school scheduling is a little bit different than elementary schedule. So if, if anybody who's familiar with elementary, there's, there's more time in elementary. Elementary is really heavily focused on math and reading. Um, so in middle school, we have our science and social studies curriculum that's in there too. So we lose some time for that. And we also lose additional time towards math in eighth grade because of world language, which is in the core. So we're dividing it. We're dividing the, at time uh, over more content in middle school. So just trying to balance that out. So we've, we've lengthened our, our amount of time that we're providing math instruction um, within our schedule. As I mentioned, the digital lessons are available now in, in sixth and seventh. Fifth grade had them last year. So with that, we've provided some time during department meetings for um, our math teachers to collaborate and to have some conversation around what's working, what's not working, what are some of our challenges that we're experiencing, uh, how has fifth grade been using digital lessons, how can they help fi uh, sixth and seventh. Um, looking at the assessment pieces, so there's some 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 of the missions have midpoint assessments. So it's it's, a, it's just analyzing the whole um, the new curriculum and giving them some time to to really just collaborate and dig dig deeper into it. Um, I mentioned we're analyzing fall and, and winter benchmark assessments. We haven't you know seen a, a tremendous amount of growth at this point, but we also think that it takes time to, when you're the implementation curve and new programming it takes time to see that growth over a, a period of time once the kids transition from grade to grade. 
and we're currently working on digging the data to try to identify some, some kids that are at risk and, and specific skill deficits that some students might have in, in math and um, been reviewing that. And the final piece that's on there too is just as, as some of you are aware, in Project Wonder we're analyzing, not that we're you know, critiquing it, but we're also just keeping an eye on our Project Wonder data because um, it's a different approach to learning math. It's more personalized, it's not as sequential as uh, the, the traditional mode is, so we're just kind of tracking that and seeing how our Project Wonder students kind of align to our traditional track to see if there's some merit there and hopefully it's either the same or better. So for next steps for math, um, as I mentioned, we're identifying grade level needs, class needs. One of the nice reports that's in FastBridge that we found that teachers liked was um, looking at some of the test questions that were in there, trying to identify which students, um, how their class kind of fared on certain questions and certain standards, and going back and looking at some, um, some warm-up questions related to the ones that they had difficulty with to try to embed those in the, the current instruction. Um, we're looking for investigating approaches to school-wide fluency, so we're trying to get together as a leadership team and, and look at programs and, and tech tools that are available to get kids interested in doing more math on a regular basis on their own time, which will have an impact overall. Um, and as for the interventions, we are, we've tried a lot of different things over the last few years, and there have been you know, some challenges and, that are identified there. What could it and would it look like? We've tried a ninth period in the schedule where we tried to do some remediation at that point in time, and we found that the kids weren't too interested in doing some remediation at the very end of the day in ninth period. Um, as I... <laughs> And as I, as I mentioned, we have, we have a, uh, an activity period in there too, and this will tie later on to SEL. Like SEL isn't something that we find as a new need for middle school. I mean, anybody who has students who went through middle school understands that there's a, it's a unique time in a student's life. And you know, we're, always, we're always thinking and focusing on ways to get them to connect with each other, to be more aware of themselves and others. And um, so this isn't something that's, that's new. It's just that we have some pieces that are already in our schedule and our programming, like activity periods, that give kids opportunities to engage in different areas of interest, try new things, meet new friends, connect with adults that have similar interests. Um, and when we embed those in the schedule, right, it takes a time slot. There's only so much time to do everything. So we're trying to figure out how do you balance out your day? How do you provide some intervention and, uh, to students without, without um, reducing the things that they really enjoy doing? Because we want to make it enjoyable. So that's always our, has been our constant struggle. Um, just considering uh, our staffing constraints. So again, every time we do intervention, this is one thing we run into. We run into the, the, the problem that we run an intervention period, but someone has to develop it, someone has to plan for it, someone has to implement it. And we end up relying on the same people who are doing the instruction in the classroom to do that work. And, and uh, when we ran an E9 period, or it was similar to like the WIND period, when we ran some ninth period, the feedback, the feedback that we received was we're, we're doing more work for this period than we are for our core content in, in planning and preparation and implementing. So we're looking at programs thinking that can we, can we look into some programs that might have been beneficial that have um, some merit to, that show growth for students in math that we can implement so they don't have to do the creation of, of uh, an intervention. Um, staffing, like I said, we've we uh, have to end up utilizing our same staff. We don't have a math interventionist like some buildings do, or a math coach, um, or a reading interventionist like that. So we end up leaning on the same you know, people to do the intervention that are doing the instruction. And also looking at summer programming and after school programming and the same thing, looking at whether we can do something in-house or do we need to look at third party options you know, to provide that. So those are some of the things we're looking at and, and investigating right now. One of the things you didn't mention is we have also looked at special education and math. So we've worked with Tracy and our building principals. Um, the, the math program that we were utilizing was not aligned to the Common Core standards, but then as kids go through, they still have to take the Algebra 1 Keystone. So we've been making those switches. That's been slower, but I think we are starting to see some success in those areas. And of course, the success that we're experiencing is more with our younger students, and they haven't yet reached the middle school yet. So it's going to, you know, it's, it's like a two... 
um, two-prong attack, right? From We realized when we made changes at middle school without making them at elementary, we weren't having enough of an impact. But our hope is as we make changes at the middle school and we make changes at the elementary, it'll come together um, with, with helping our students grow. So as far as the ELA component goes, looking at where we are at the middle school and giving a snapshot of what that looks like, we are continuing the current curriculum uh, for the Rob, 2020. Rob, before we go oh, on, sorry. I'm sorry not to cut you off here, but before we go on to ELA, just thinking about math is, so you have some variables that we're changing now to hopefully make a difference. Mm -hmm. Are you looking to the future to say, all right, we look at the numbers next year and nothing's changed? we have to look at new variables. I, I would encourage you to start thinking about that already because it's there's going to be it's going to be harder and harder to think of all right we, we can just add more time we could just add more remediation is there a point in time where we have to say we have to look at things at a much more foundational level as to how we're doing things because um, it's been the numbers have been down for a little while so I hope it's just adding more time I hope that's it, but I, I just I, I encourage you to think about all right. What are the other variables that we need to think about that we might have to change event, eventually? Um, it's just something that, that occurred to me here. No, and I and I agree with you, Joe. I don't think it's just time. Like I don't think it's just time. I think programming is a key piece of it, and we'll see how that plays out as the cohorts kind of move from grade level to grade level. Like there's a foundational component where um, it's developing the foundational skills that you'll see that our data has showed that there has been a decline from grade level to grade level, from fifth grade to sixth grade, from sixth grade to seventh grade, from seventh grade to eighth grade. And in math, it's really those building blocks. So when, you, when you're developing those foundational skills in math that build upon each other, um, they do, I mean, you're, you're seeing that kind of transition. You're seeing that it falls apart at some point. Right, because we don't have those foundational skills. So I think a consistency in program is that we've never had before will be beneficial. I also think that trying to figure out, we've been having a lot of conversation about remediation. So like the, the time we have in the day is our activity period, which is a fun kind of engagement time for students. I don't want to, and, and other schools have taken away, um, have utilized some of their specials, right? So again, another time that kids really enjoy. So you have to figure out a time when you're going to add in that remediation or add additional, you know, resources and time to students in, in the in the schedule. And it's not just time, but it is a piece of it. And you know, I think we do need to do some things differently to provide that. Yeah. Um, but it's also comes at a cost, right? To do that to our students and everything else that we kind of that we value. There's a lot of things we value. So it comes at a cost, and we we are understanding of that. But it's how do you get kids engaged in a in a program? Those who need it, right? And what make them want to be there and have some incentive and make it it's it's building that kind of um, building that that structure that doesn't isn't a deterrent right because the last thing we want is for kids to go and say all right well I'm not good at math and now I have to do another 45 minutes of math a day mm -hmm. right so it's finding that that trying to overcome that struggle. I just wanted to add something that that I think Zern has done for us. Since we're implementing this K to eight, it is going to be consistency. And we may not see that improvement at the middle school level until these kids start with this foundation down in elementary school. And as it moves through, hopefully that consistency will pay off. Right. And the fact that all the kids are getting the same thing all the teachers are getting the same professional development. All the teachers are working together. I think that's eventually going to pay off. Maybe not this year or next year, but as they move through, I think, I think hopefully we will see that improvement. And, and I think we're, we're already tracking that growth, right, from third grade on up. So I think we'll, we'll, we, we'll definitely be tracking the progress that happens from you know, the implementation, the starting point to you know, the future. I have two questions specifically about math. So, um, first of all, how's it being? Is is it being implemented at all? Are, are you using math and social studies and science to any great degree? Because I mean, you read everywhere, right? And you have very few kids who end up at the end of the line being totally illiterate 
because you read all the time. Um, I, you know, used to teach physics in a prior life, and I saw kids at the end of the line who couldn't use math to do anything, right? They could go through the algorithms, but they couldn't apply it to anything. And, you know, I have a friend who's a historian and uses data analysis for, um, you know, tracking disease and the effects of that on, you know, the, the culture at large, yada, yada. So it's it's in there. And, I mean, math and any type of, of science at any any real depth is all math. So how is math being used in other areas of the curriculum where it's not as obvious? Yeah, so definitely science. So there's there's a lot of conversation around the overlap between science, the grade level science and grade level math standards and where the overlap is. I, um, in the past, we've spent a lot of time and investigating, like sharing of that, like how, when does it happen? When you implement a program, the hard part is you have to follow the program, right? So you're following the program from start to finish, and sometimes, sometimes where like scientific notation falls in this unit in science doesn't always align to where it falls in math. In a in a great situation, it would happen at the same time, right? You'd have it so they're learning the same concept across multiple curriculum. But it, it doesn't happen that way all the time. So they're, they're hitting upon it. They're, I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot of overlap within our science. And as you know, our science standards um, are going to be changing too. So we're in the process of, of um, investigating, learning more about the next gen science standards and you know, seeing the overlap between. Uh, and, and in the next gen, part of it is that there's a huge writing component in that. So it's, it's about debate. It's our you know, f debate and writing about your findings. And, and every, so it's going to be all in, in cumbersome. So, we are, we are looking at that. I mean, I think it's more so in the science and in the social studies, to be honest with you, but I think they're, they're, um, we're having discussions at a team meeting, which we'll, which we'll talk about a little bit later, too. But that's one of the benefits of the middle school. We meet every day as a team. So teams have a lot of time to collaborate on you know, cross-curricular activities and how they align. Um, and specials is a little bit more difficult because of the communication barrier. Many of our specialists uh, a few years ago went part-time, so they're not there for you know, our department meeting or our team meetings, they're not in, and they, they engage through Google Docs and Google communication, um, but it's not as easy for them to, you know, to, there's, there, not that it's not happening, of course there's a lot of math happening in our STEM class, but, um, but in other areas such as art, although it does connect and we've done some things in art and music related to it, like notes and, and things before, it's, it's difficult because we've minimized our time or reduced our time in specials, so it's, it would be taking away again from the focus of, of what kids are trying to engage in and what they really like to do. But we, we are trying to find some cross-curricular connections. Yeah, music is all math too. Um, do you have any, I, I know that you don't have the data yet, but do you have a general sense of how Project Wonder kids compare to their peers who are not in Project Wonder? Are you seeing more or less of them going to advanced math in seventh grade? Are you seeing, um, it, it, are you seeing higher or lower grades and, you know, as you cross from one we're, to the we're other? We're seeing very similar to what we're seeing in other classes. So we're seeing that, I mean, in Project Wonder more so, I'll, I'll say that kids who are extremely motivated to do well in it are, are progressing quick, and more quickly, right? So it's, I think in that sense, the, if the motivation and, and motivation and support and everything else is allowing them to move um, farther and more deeply into the curriculum than in some of our other classes. But again, it's it's a wide range, and it's not the data that I'm looking at so far is showing that it's pretty consistent to other grades. It's not showing that it's that they're scoring higher or scoring. On um, the other, the other difficult thing with math too, and I, and we should probably share this at some other point. We've shared it with the board in the past a couple of times. It's just understanding our PSSA assessments um, it, and the Common Core assessments, and understanding that it's it. When we look at our data, we can tell like what, and not just this this uh, FastBridge data, but other data sources that we have. We're able to see where skills deficits are based on concepts. So certain kids are struggling in certain concepts, and we can provide that remediation on those concepts. But the test, the standardized test from the state isn't just about concepts. It's, it used to be, and we did really well, and it was about concepts. But um, when it shifted, it's, it's more about critical thinking and applying concepts and being able to do, and, and if you, we can share some of, the, um, some of the, the released items from the state to take a look at what we're asking kids to do at, at different levels and the complexity of some of the problems, a lot of it's reading. 
So a lot of it's reading, a lot of it's heavy on vocabulary. So we're trying to embed some of that. Like if, if you don't understand what you're reading, if you don't understand the terminology, you really struggle on some of the problems. So it's not just about knowing, knowing how to do math. It's about being able to take that, understanding what you're reading, understanding what they're asking for, comprehending that, and, and then coming to a multi-step solution to a problem. So it can be pretty complex. And that makes it difficult to, uh, it makes it difficult at times too to try to um, remediate because it's not just, you're not just looking at the skill. Um, I have a quick comment and a question. Um, I think when it comes to Project Wonder, it's going to be important to note that, is this, either, is this the first year or the second year that science and math are in Project Wonder? Uh, second year, I believe. Second year. So, you know, the data might not show a lot of difference yet. Um, my question is, um, have we been able, able to pull any best practices for remediation from other middle schools who use Zern and Eureka? I'm not, I'm not familiar, Kelly, you have about Zern and Eureka. Um. No, um, no, but that's, that's a, it's something I can definitely, definitely do. Um, one of the things with Zern is that the digital lesson aligns to the, uh, to the teaching lesson. They don't have one for every single lesson, but the ones that do align. And so they actually allow teachers to bookmark lessons um, that are foundational skills. And they give you a roadmap to say, you know, if you're working on this concept and kids, here's how it all aligns and you can go back and you can bookmark those lessons, but when do kids do it, right? When, and this is the first year that sixth and seventh grade, um, they didn't have those lessons last year. They didn't roll them out. Um, it was delayed because of the pandemic. Um, so they didn't have those. So this is the first year that they have them. Um, and I don't, you know, that's still work in progress for figuring out how to use them in, in the classroom. So that's one of the things is that they actually show um, that that's one of the tools you can use to help fill in those gaps. Um, but I can look at some other districts. Um, I've had some conversation with Wilson West Lawn, they use Eureka. Boyertown uses Eureka. There's actually quite a few districts in the area that we can we can look to and we can get some information. And it's still a work in progress at the elementary school for math and intervention. How are we doing it? And we keep we keep making different you know, we keep making changes based on what we you know, last year was is our first year and so it wasn't a normal year, so we didn't really figure a lot of those ancillary pieces pieces out. I was just wondering because if, you know, staff time in developing these remediation problems is a sticking point, like maybe we don't need to recreate the wheel, maybe we can just pull in the work that somebody else has done. Okay, back to ELA. <laughs> Sorry. Hello well, again. So as I was saying, uh, the ELA 5 through 8 at the middle school, uh, Obviously, we're doing a continuation of our current curriculum for the 21-22 school year. Uh, as Ken mentioned, there was a little bit of a change in the, in the schedule, so there's been a reduction of time. Uh, the presentation that was given uh, earlier with wit and wisdom, there is a fifth grade pilot in our building. Um, so you saw some of the benefits of that program being in the fifth grade. Uh, but as we look and work through ELA at the middle school, uh, you know, our teachers at the middle school use department time to talk about uh, approaches to aligning uh, ELA. Uh, instruction in grades five through eight. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, 25% 25 25 of state testing is based on TDAs. So our teachers are working at ways to help students identify what are ways to look at an analysis and analyze the information to be able to uh, look at what the text is and how to connect with it. Um, Cross-curricular activities, uh, being a social study teacher myself, you know, we're all teachers of reading and writing. So how are we now looking at ways to implement some of the strategies that teachers are using in their ELA classes and implementing them in, in classes like science and social studies? And how are they looking at the vocabulary? So there's a lot of things that encompasses, you know, and, and the teaming model that we have at the middle school allows us to do some of that because teachers meet on a daily ba basis. So they're able to, to kind of talk about students, talk about these, these um, activities, talk about how they can help each other out as we move throughout the school year. Uh, once again, we're looking at benchmark data at the middle school, uh, looking at uh, different assessments to kind of track student progress, look at areas of strength and weaknesses to look at ways that we can look at approaches. 
um, identify those students who are at risk and identify specific skill deficits so that we're looking at activities or, or breaking down into groups within classrooms that look at addressing some of those specific needs, uh, whether it be in, in a cross curricular activity or even in, in the ELA classroom. And as Ken mentioned, once again, looking at Project Wonder data, how are we looking at you know, the, the, con the consistency between traditional and personalized learning and making sure that we are meeting the needs of all of our students in grades five through eight. As far as our next steps go, you know, using the data that we currently have, whether it be classroom data or FastBridge data, as, as Kelly mentioned about the data that we have that we're trying to use to kind of make those connections to help us understand better student learning and, and to see where we can actually address some of the needs of our students. Uh, identifying students for more intensive intervention, and, and Ken kind of mentioned that a little bit about looking at, you know, how are ways that we can involve our students, teachers, admin, including some of our support services to provide time, to provide time to look at some of the skills that that um, we need to focus on and need to work on with our students. So I think that's one of the things that we sit down and look at and provide that ample time, whether it be um, providing additional activities, providing additional uh, support for those students that obviously need it at that time. Um, planning summer enrichment programs and intervention programs, you know, obviously we're looking to, to kind of support in the, in the summer months uh, to help students obviously continue their growth. So looking at programs that might be available through teachers that want to run programs or looking at programs that might be uh, available in our community, but just to try to support our students any way we can, especially during the summer months when we tend to take a, a step back from the everyday structure that some students see. Um, Continue the ELA pilot in fifth grade. We talked a little bit about how teachers can, as, as the next point states, states um, giving some chances for teachers to co collaborate, being able to work on some things that uh, they can exchange ideas. And I think it was kind of mentioned at the elementary, you know, how are we looking at ways that we can collaborate across the board since it is going to be uh, wisdom be K through five and working collaboratively with elementary to kind of see how when they transition into the middle school, how are we supporting the needs of all those students that are coming, which I think is beneficial for, you know, families and students making that transition and understanding what the expectations are moving into the fifth grade and the middle school level. And one of the best things our kids could do is just read, like read, like go to the library and read. And so getting books in our kids' hands, the more you read, the, the better you read. So then uh, switching over to SEL, um, we've been taking a look at our FastBridge data the last you know, few days since we got the, the winter assessment data back and helping teams dig into it and, and look at the uh, Sabres uh, data that's in there, which is focused on SEL and how students um, self-identified and, and which students self-identified as having some risk and in which areas and just sitting with teachers to dig through all of that just to make us aware of how kids were feeling at the time they took the test and to see if it aligns with what we know and what we don't know or any surprises and things we need to, to dig deeper into and look into. So we're developing a plan for supporting students, you know, moving forward with um, uh, just connecting with parents and students and implementing some SEL activities within the building as well. So as a reminder for e ELA and math and Sabres, they're screening devices. So they're, they're going to be false positives. <laughs> There's going to be, because it's, it's meant to identify kids who have issues. Um, so you have to take what you know there with other information about the student uh, to identify who's really at risk. So it's just a screening device. And I would say, Ken, that it'd be fair to say that SEL took the forefront of the fall coming back to school. This was the area of focus for, for um, all of our schools, I think. So this was a bigger piece. Um, so it's not that we weren't thinking about intervention all year, but we, we were tackling that, those pieces first. So Right. Good point. Um, and this slide is just focused on some of the, the um, some of the, the structures we have in place and things we have in place to support our students and with uh, the social emotional learning. So we have our counseling sessions, Mr. Dorn, Ms. Bove, and Mrs. Propsner. We have guidance lessons that are implemented throughout the building. Teaming structure, which is a big one that's different from other buildings. We have the, the we're fortunate enough to have a teaming model at the middle school where our teams meet every day. So this is. Um, kind of our starting point for student discussion. Every Tuesday and Thursday, administrators, guidance counselors, behavior interventionists, psychologists, when we have them in place, um, will be part of these meetings to have conversations with teams to identify what the specific needs are of some of our students and how do we provide some um, intervention, you know, prior to even, you know, making it to a child study meeting and looking at an evaluation. So it's looking at how can we support students throughout the year. 
Um, we have child study and SAP referrals um, that happen as well as concern referrals for counseling that takes place in the building. And we're looking into a fifth grade summer academy for transitioning over, getting some time to you know, meet their teachers, uh, students interact over the summer. So we're in the process of putting that transition event together or events together. Um, like I just mentioned, the behavior interventionist, which is gonna be a, a, a huge benefit to the middle school um, and working with our teams, working with students for work completion, any other behavioral you know, pieces that we're seeing um, as the year goes on. SEL focused activities on a monthly basis, fo focus on the castle model. So um, we've, we've had some teams who've you know, implemented some, some SEL activities whole team wide based on the five pillars of, of castle. So we've been working on like self-awareness and self-management you know, for the last two months, but they're gonna be working their way through the five pillars. And uh, we've implemented recess, a 30 minute recess in the schedule. So that, that was, um, has been really nice for our, our students and we've seen some benefits from that. We've noticed that there's been a, a lag at the end of the day, you know, and, and we know that from, the, from you know, research too, that just how much, how much of a benefit on the brain the movement and you know, an activity has. So we've seen you know, more of a focus in the afternoon than we've seen in the past prior to having a recess in the schedule. And like I mentioned before, clubs and activities that we greatly value, it's just trying to figure out the balance. We have a lot of clubs and activities in, that we provide that are, you know, kids find exciting and interesting. One of the things that I wanted to add to that last slide was in addition to our staff taking time to meet with students and talk through teaming, um, you know, we look at our, our, our SRO in a building who meets with kids regularly, who tries to support them, support us. Um, so he, he takes time, Officer Lake, he takes time to, to get into the classrooms, be around the kids, be in the cafeteria, uh, hold counseling sessions with students. Um, so that's, that's been also a very, very great resource that we have in our building that kind of builds, builds upon some of the needs that we have um, going on here, and then also our social worker providing, you know, times that if our if our social worker needs to intervene, give time for parents to connect with them so they can look at what other programs are available. So we really take advantage of all the resources we have at the middle level to kind of support our families and, stu and students, uh, you know, especially coming back after what we've dealt with over the past, you know, several months and where we are now. So thank you. Can I just make a, throw a comment out there? Can we just be a little sensitive to throwing around acronyms so much and not saying what that acronym is? Oh. Not everybody at home has the ability to see what's on the screen. And originally when you, it took me a second to realize what SEL was because I don't work with it every day. Um, I should know it right off the top of my head, but I was like running through my head, through the acronyms. What does he mean? Um, so it, you, you live it day to day. It just helpful to, to us and everybody at home to be a little redundant, I guess. Good point. Thanks. So I know that when we had the similar presentation last time from the elementary school, um, concern is waitlisted. And I know that Mr. Mushlitz mentioned they brought in like Valley Youth House and uh, Center for Humanistic Change. Are you guys doing anything similar to help support uh, the needs of kids who need something a little bit more intense? We're not. We're actually not waitlisted with concern right now. We, the, only, the only thing that we have is we've had some, um, and, and reaching out to them, we, we, every student who needed con, uh, support from concern or receiving it, it's usually just a lag in getting paperwork back, or it has to do with insurance. And it has to do with you know getting, have, making sure we have ca ca concern as counselors that are vetted through different insurance companies. So if that doesn't work out, our route is usually working through the social worker, you know, to find appropriate, you know, <coughs> find counseling services that work with their insurance company. But we're not waitlisted, no. And then in addition to that, we also have our SAP process, which we involve CHC, Center for Humanistic Change. Right. So they are... <laughs> So they, they are definitely involved in, in, in that process of trying to help support kids when they're identified by anyone in our community, whether it be in the building, in the community, teacher, staff. So we do, we do have them as part of the process to help support students in need. Since um, Project Wonder came up a few times, I was curious if you've established a good transition plan for the students that are gonna be moving out of it and into the high school. I know we've had some feedback on that. Has that been squared away or? So I'm not sure what you mean by squared away. Um, like are, the, are, the, are the students 
So the students, I believe, have scheduled at the high school, so they've had an opportunity to meet individually with the counselors, and maybe I should defer to Ms. Morningstar, um, to, eat, to meet individually with counselors and select courses. Some of the students have chosen LCTI programming. Um, at this time, we do not have Project Wonder at, at the high school for the fall, um, so there is no actual program for Project Wonder, but the counselors are working with the kids to be sure that they're choosing a course load that's uh, reflective of their interests and their credit needs for ninth grade. Do you yeah, want to add I, I would say that the feedback the counselors have received from the students coming to the high school and from the parents who attended the presentation was that largely they were not aware um, of the amount of choice that students have at the high school in selecting classes uh, because, you know, in elementary school they travel as a cohort and still very much so in middle school. Um, at the high school, most classes with the exception of English are mixed grade level classes, and all electives are mixed grade level electives. Um, so the students have been surprised and um, excited by the breadth of offerings that they've had. Um, a number of the Project Wonder students have indicated an interest in LCTI, um, which is very hands-on and very project-based as well. Um, and I think that the other thing that they will see is that while as they explore and uh, come into ninth grade, they're going to find that there is a lot of connection and interconnectedness between the topics that they're exploring, for example, in the humanities and looking at their social studies class and then the literature that emerges out of that same time period that they're studying. And oh yeah, that's why they're writing about this kind of stuff. Um, so while we frankly just don't have the staffing um, to add any more offerings right now, um, the kids seem very excited at what the possibilities are. Yeah, as the, um, just to add my own experience, as the parent of an eighth grader in Project Wonder who's going to the high school, I was like blown away by the amount of choices as was my student. So, and um, just for reference sake, the first group of Project Wonder students is in ninth grade at the high school right now. Yeah. Yep. And how, how is that, but how is that group have they found success at the high school with the, the difference in the learning model? Like, I, I, okay, yeah, I think that's the bigger question. Are they are they transitioning successfully from Project Wonder? I actually met with all of them uh, individually and then as groups of both. Um, Heather, can you use the microphone, please? I'm sorry, I was just having a conversation. <laughs> and then both as uh, individuals and then as groups of students, the LCTI, um, students who continued in LCTI and were in Project Wonder and students who did not um, participate in LCTI and were in Project Wonder. Um, they uh, spoke, and I had shared that feedback with Lynn and Kelly, they spoke very glowingly about the choices that they have, um, the opportunities for things like dual enrollment and college credits. Um, they like the alternating schedule very much at the high school, uh, that they have eight classes, but they're separated over the course of the two days. Uh, the kids in LCTI have really found success in that realm as well. Um, you know, there, there were some concerns they noted about the change in their learning modalities when they came to the high school, uh, but nothing, you know, nothing substantial, I guess I would say. Okay, any other questions or? Not a question, but just maybe a thought, is you have the, you have the group of ninth graders that are now, that are gonna be in 10th grade next year with another group coming in. Yes. Maybe using them as kind of, ease the concerns of kids coming up, saying, hey, we did this transition last year, and, it, and having them engage with each other as like Project Wonder alumni, for lack of a better term. Okay, thank you. And as I've said many times before, one of the best things they ever did at the middle school was put in that daily team teaching time. I feel that we have met the needs of our students a whole lot better. We have pinpointed students that need help, assistance, a whole lot better. Kids are not th falling through the cracks there like they did prior to the team teaching time being uh, put in the schedule. I think that's wonderful. So thank you. Okay, with that we'll move on to special education continuum of services with Dr. Jacoby. Hello. Can everybody hear me? 
Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, So thank you for allowing me to um, share with you our continuum of special education services this evening. Um, Over the course of the last five or so years, um, we've really looked at our programming here at Salisbury, how we could um, bring back some of the programs that were um, that our students went to in out of district placements from the IU, from um, other local school districts. And just to give you a little bit of a background, back in the 2019-2020 school year, we returned um, services in the areas of speech and language and emotional support. What we did, it was under a transfer of entity um, with our IU because we contracted our services through IU 21 for speech and language and also (laughs) for the elementary emotional support program. During that same school year, as you know, COVID hit. Um, And we had also um, looked at running our own extended school year program and that we refer to that as ESY. So if you hear me say ESY, that's what I'm referring to. Um, We had all of our students that qualified for extended school year services went to the IU for programming. So the IU not only did our students that they provided services for during the regular school year, but then our learning support students or our students um, that might have some complex learning needs as well. During the 2021-2022 school year, this school year, we Um, it was probably about this time last year that we came to you as the board with a need, a need to open up um, our own elementary autistic support classroom. Last year, at this point in time, we had kids that were um, outplaced in IU 20, IU 21, and IU 22. Some of those students waited from the beginning of the school year until December or until January to be able to get placed because we could not find a placement. All of the local IUs were full. So that's when we started really running the numbers and looking at, is this something that we can do, you know, in-house, bring our students back to their neighborhood school When we first proposed this last year, we were looking at the autistic support classroom to service students in first through third grades, because that's where our need was. We were looking to bring four students back from IU programming. Um, And then at that point in time, we were looking at the potential of additional students coming into the program. We knew we would be able to start off with four Um, So from the time that we proposed the program until the beginning of the school year, we had a a kindergartner transition in from EI, which is early intervention services. We had a second grader that moved from learning support to autistic support. We had a fourth grader that transferred into the district with autistic support services in his IEP. And then we had another kindergartner that was evaluated in the fall. So we went from proposing the class to begin last year in March with four kids to a class of eight kids being full by, I believe it was October, November-ish. With that, um, what the federal regulations say is that we need to offer a continuum of services um, within this within our scope of the district. Now that can be within the school district or we can utilize supports and services outside of the school district through our IU, through other local IUs, if our IU is full or other local school districts. So right now we are utilizing um, IU 21 for life skills support, multiple disability support behavioral. That is very similar to autistic support. Um, It's got that behavioral component multiple disabilities, functional support, emotional support. We utilize um, the emotional support for the center-based programs over at LAS, which is Lehigh Learning Achievement School, and ALAS, um, which is Allentown um, Learning Achievement School. However, Allentown Learning Achievement School right now, all of those students are over at LAS due to numbers. 
Um, but they're doing some restructuring for next year. So that will be, um, we'll have students back over there. We also use the SITES program, which is a partial hospitalization program. And we also have students in the VIP, the vocational independence program and project search um, that they're ending, they're coming near the, the ending of their um, time with us to be aging out and we're trying to get them employability skills. For our continuum of services, um, also outside of uh, the school district, we utilize IU-20. We have students in a partial hospitalization program in IU-20. We have um, a student in autistic support in Allentown School District. And we also utilize Catasauqua Area School District for um, life skills at the middle school and the high school level for a few students. So when you look at the continuum of services within Salisbury Township School District, we offer a lot for a very small school, which we're very fortunate. We have excellent support staff, we have excellent teachers and excellent administrators that really believe in our students being included as much as possible and also within their neighborhood school. So if you look at this chart, we have um, the programs that we currently have for 2021 in um, all of the buildings, we have learning support. In all of the buildings, we currently now have emotional support. We also have speech and language support in all of the buildings as a related service. At the elementary building, like I mentioned before, we added our autistic support classroom last um, this past school year. And then at the high school, we have a transitional learning support classroom. So where we're seeing a gap is um, the transitional learning support or a, a spot at the middle school. And we're proposing a transitional learning support classroom to fill that gap so that we've got students that can potentially move from autistic support to the transitional learning support in the middle school and then remain there in our schools for high school. Um, what we're also looking at proposing for next school year is another autistic support classroom. Um, as we say, um, you know, if we build it, they will come and, and we, sh we, we, we were able to show that this past school year by proposing the classroom to start with four students and then being full just after two months of opening the classroom. So looking at the proposed need and the numbers for the additional elementary autistic support class, the end of January, beginning of February, we conducted our EI early intervention transition meetings where we meet with every single family of a school aged child to determine number one, are they going to enroll in kindergarten this upcoming school year? And then they're able to share um, the students needs and the family share the students needs with us as a school district so that we can start looking at um, what kind of assessments do we need to do because we need to now um, evaluate them for school age evaluation to determine if they will qualify for school aged programming. When we looked at that we as of now we have 13 students that are transitioning in we always get more between now and the start of school because it's a rolling enrollment through EI so kids can be tested at any time and then if they're school age eligible um, early intervention services will pass that information on to us so these are our numbers as of now but like I said we will get more um, in the upcoming months so out of the 13 students it looks like seven students are going to need some type or some amount of autistic support. It could range from an itinerant check-in level to a full-time, which is what we have right now. So with the class that we have right now, um, we will have seven students in it for next year to start next year. We have one fourth grader that will transition up to the middle school. And we were hoping that that student would transition into our, um, the proposed new transitional learning support classroom. So that leaves one spot open if we don't look at adding a new classroom for next year. And we have potentially six other students that would need a spot. Um, what we're having difficulty with, again, is the um, availability of programming 
in our IU and other local IUs. We've had a couple students that have moved in that may need some level of autistic support. Once we've, you know, looked into the programming, um, IU 20 is full, IU, IU 20 in Northampton County is full, and IU 21 <sighs> is full. IU 20 has openings up in Stroudsburg or Pocono Mountain, but that's a really far bus ride for an elementary aged student that is on the um, spectrum to be on a bus that long. So we're really looking, um, looking for that second additional class this year to start this year with. Um, and that would, if our projections go based on what we have as of now, that leaves one spot at the kindergarten level for, um, and for an opening in the kindergarten autistic support class and one available spot for first through fourth grades. And that is pending any students transferring out. So looking at the projected costs, um, Christine was very um, helpful in getting um, and helping me with the projections here with the anticipated um, salaries. If we were to look at um, sending all seven of those students out to an IU program, it would cost us just over um, $467,000. Um, and that is projecting that um, those students would cost us about $54,000 in program costs before transportation. This, the cost of a student in an MDS behavioral or an autistic support classroom fluctuates between 50 and it could be as high as $75,000 in an IU program, depending on the student's needs. If we look at um, the total cost to run our own program, it would be just over, it would it'd be just shy of uh, $300,000. Um, and really it, it allows us to guarantee that we have spots available for our students um, with the level and type of support that they need. And it also would um, guarantee that the students are educated in their neighborhood school with their neighborhood friends, their peers, and also their siblings. Looking at the, the costs for the transitional learning support class at the middle school, what we're looking at is um, the transition learning support class is kind of a, an in-between class of um, students that have complex learning needs. So they could have an intellectual disability, they could have autism, they could have uh, multiple disabilities to support their unique learning needs in a smaller class with more adult support. So in a learning support class, typically our, stu our, st our teachers can caseload and case manage up to 22 to 26 kids, depending on the breakdown. Um, this class, we'd really look at topping out at 10 to 12 students. So it would really be um, very um, staff intensive, a lot of one-on-one -on -one instruction, a lot of small group instruction, um, looking at routines, looking at visual schedules, looking at picture schedules. Um, now, because they're transitioning to the middle school, looking at pre-vocational skills, discriminatory skills, um, following directions with independence, um, functional reading and math, uh, supplemental curriculum, um, direct instruction that would really benefit students that um, may be struggling or may need a little more support than what a typical learning support setting could provide. So with looking at that, um, we would be looking at bringing some students back into the district. So we currently have um, three, four students that we would be looking to bring back. Um, one or two students that if we would not um, look at opening this classroom would potentially need to go to an IU, either autistic support or life skills classroom, which could be an additional cost for us for out of district. Um, the total cost for us to run this program with 
um, one teacher and two full-time IAs would be just over $237,000. So in conclusion, um, you know, there is a need for um, additional supports within our district to support our students in their neighborhood uh, school within a, a more structured program. Um, like I mentioned before, it is becoming increasingly difficult to find specialized placements within the IU. Um, all, the, all of the autistic support and MDS behavioral classes are full right now. They're on waiting lists and they're on waiting lists for a good portion of the school year. Um, opening up an additional autistic support class at SES would um, give us a program savings of about $175,000 because that would mean we wouldn't have to send those students outside of the district. Um, we would have two available spots for any incoming students that um, come in through early intervention between now and the start of the school year or any students that transfer in because we always get students that transfer in um, that, that, that could potentially need this level of support and services. And then adding the transitional learning support class at the middle school would save us um, roughly around 180,000 by bringing four students back and the potential for additional students not needing to be outplaced. Um, and it also fills that gap. As you saw in the um, chart earlier, there's that gap at the middle school. We pretty much have learning support and we have emotional support. There's no in between there. All right, any thoughts, questions? Yeah, um, I actually have one here. It, you did a great job of outlining at least all the, the, the staffing costs that were listed here and also bringing up what the cost savings would be. But um, as far as like from a facility, from a classroom setup, is there other costs that are associated that go into that to, to help? Because I mean, I'm just trying to get a whole holistic picture of it. So typically, um, and what I did put in there, we did add in, um, to that slide on my stuff here. We did put in for curriculum and materials. So depending on the students, depending on their needs, um, we may need some curricular materials. Um, we currently have, um, so, you know, reading programs um, that may work, that the students are working with now. So that may not be a need. We may also have math. It would basically depend on the students' needs. But what we also do have is, um, I can't remember how many years ago, maybe three years ago, we purchased Unique Learning Systems, which is a thematic um, supplemental curriculum to work with your um, students with complex learning needs. And it is differentiated on three different levels so that if, you're ch if the student is a, is a word reader, the curriculum and instructions and um, guides that go along with it are all in words and sentences and paragraphs. The middle level would be that we've got the words paired with a picture. And then the, um, the next level would be for our students that are still working on picture icons and that they would be reading a story based on the picture icons instead of words. So we do currently have that um, and we would continue to get that. We may need more licenses though, depending on, um, how many students we have in the program. And as far as uh, uh, classroom space, I mean, we have room for them. There's no issues around that. Correct. Um, in talking with Mr. Brem and, um, and Mrs. Fweeney Hetton about that, um, you know, there will be some moves, um, but we do have, we have identified classroom space that would be available. Thank you. Sure. So let's give a little more detail on that so that we're clear of, so everybody's trans, we're transparent about what we're looking at because we are running out of space in the elementary building and we are choosing to prioritize space uh, for these for these special education programs and that comes at a cost like <laughs> everything else. So sh should the board approve the autistic, the additional autistic support classroom at the elementary level, we would um, look to place that classroom in the C-Pod, um, where we're currently are utilizing as a speech and behavior intervention is spaced right now. That is a shared space. 
it's important when we add a special education classroom that we look um, to include students in a hallway where there's grade level uh, classrooms included as well. We wouldn't want to add a classroom and then place them in a location within the building where transitions are difficult from from the autistic support classroom into a general ed setting. Uh, so we would want to keep them included in, in a grade level pod. Um, that would mean that we would have to shift the individuals that are in that location to a different um, location. Um, we're also taking a look at our, our kindergarten <coughs> enrollment currently that has held steady. We added a kindergarten teacher earlier this school year, um, and I anticipate that we would need to um, transition those students into the same amount of classrooms in first grade as well. So as a result of that, um, we may have some specialist teachers that need to deliver instruction within, a, within homeroom settings rather than their own space within the building. And any, um, if we look to add these classrooms, we would have to go through an approval process through PDE, which would look at um, them coming in. If the, the classroom space isn't currently being used for a special education program or class, we would have to do a site visit with our um, advisor from the Bureau of Special Education. Um, and they would have to make sure um, two things. Number one, it's within the ebb and flow of the school building. Like Mr. Brem said, we would want it in a grade level um, hallway that it's, it's near typically developing students. And the other area would be that the size allotment is appropriate. Um, the regulations for special education say that you need 28 square feet per child in that special education room. So for our autistic support students, we cap out at eight students. So um, a typical classroom size is more than ample to be um, approved for a special education classroom. Tracy, Sam DeFrank, uh, just curious, what is your probability of actually getting people hiring staff to fill these positions in the time frame that you're given? I and mean, we are struggling in many areas to fill. Uh, if we do go ahead and do this, I mean, how soon do you need approval to be able to get ahead of this and get the hiring done so we, we start uh, the, the beginning of the school year? Great question, um, Mr. DeFrank. Um, we would want to get ahead of it as soon as possible because you know, as well as I do, um, staffing, shortage, staffing shortages are occurring across all disciplines, um, especially special education and also with our IAs. Um, so we would want to, for, for the special... For the teacher positions, the positions have to be posted for 30 days. So we would want to be to move as quickly as possible with that because we yes, we are in March right now, but let me tell you, those May graduates are already looking for jobs. My daughter is graduating in May and she's already putting feelers out and getting her applications ready. So they're going to get snatched up pretty quickly. So the sooner we do it, I think the better. I had one last question, and that savings, does that savings include transportation costs for bringing our kids back into the district? I did not calculate transportation, no. So that we possibly might have an extra savings? There could potentially be more of a savings. Okay. Tracy, can you dive a little bit deeper? Um, you, you touched on it, and this piggybacks on Carol's question. Um, the proposed cost, if we use the IU for for uh, either the learning support or the autistic class, you touched on it on a very high level. But what the one says that it's a proposed cost of four hundred eighteen thousand, and the other one is four hundred sixty seven thousand, and all the way down to twenty cents. What really makes up that cost? Sure, um, and maybe Christine can help me out a little bit too, um, but. So when you're looking at um, IU costs, um, the costs are all different and they're based on student needs. So one student could be $45,000, one student could be $90,000. It's based on um, the type of program. Um, it's also based on the, I believe it's the average daily membership of how many students are in that classroom at that time because then that gets split across the district. So say there's, we're looking at an MDS behavioral class, which is very similar to an autistic support class. You're looking at maxing out at eight students. Um, if we've got four of those students, we're going to pay for, um, you know, half of that cost that our students 
could be potentially, um, you know, at 50,000, that's $200,000, but then also looks at what kind of related services do they get? Do they get OT? Do they get PT? Do they get speech and language? Do they get vision? Do they get hearing? Do they have a one-on-one? Do they have specialized transportation? Do they have a, a monitor on the bus? So there are so many different variables that it, it's very hard to pinpoint exactly what um, what the average cost is because it ranges. Um, the cost for a, an MDS behavioral class is could be much higher than a life skills because elementary life skills, you could go up to 12 students so that that classroom cost or the, the room cost with your IAs and your teachers is now split across 12 students rather than eight students. Thank you. Sure. I have a bunch of questions. I'm sorry, Tracy. Sure. <laughs> um, was there an autistic support when we still had two elementary schools? Was there one at Truman? No, we just started autistic support this year. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. So... Okay, just just to clarify, the seven out of thirteen students, they're projected to need some level of autistic support, but an autistic support classroom may not be the appropriate place for them. We're not sure yet. Is that is that kind of where we're at, or are these seven? You pretty much think they're going to need that classroom? I guess is so. These these seven, we're pretty sure they're going to need some level of autistic support, whether it be full time, which they're in all day. Supplemental, which they're in pretty much um, the majority of the day, except for specials. Um, they might be out for um, a science class, a content area class for a part of the day. And itinerant is more of like a check in, check mm-hmm. out. Um, there may be one or two students that may just need a check in, check out, but the, the, and actually, I think it may only be one. I don't have my list in front of me, but I think it may only be one that might need that. And the the remaining six are going to need more of um, more intensive um, level of support. Okay. Um, so just okay, I, I'm I'm still not 100 percent clear on transitional learning support. So is this looked at? First of all, is that considered a less restrictive placement than, like, for example, a life skills class would be? So actually, I mean, when you look at less restrictive, it's going to be more of um, how much time you're included. So it could be more restrictive depending on if the child needs to be in that transitional learning support class for ELA and math and then goes out for science and social studies or if they're in there for all of their content area classes. So it, it could be, it could vary, um, Mrs. McKelvey. Um, the difference between, it's kind of in between a learning support classroom with the students that may need more support than what they typically get in a learning support classroom, but it might not be as much support or as intensified supports and services as a life skills or an autistic support. Okay. So it's kind of that tweener class. Okay. That answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Um, sure. So if we end up with these classrooms and have extra space, does that mean we can accept students from other districts and they would pay tuition then to us? Potentially. Okay. Yes, it could. Um, and, you know, that's something... I did get calls earlier in the school year about the space at um, in our autistic support classroom. However, I knew in the back of my mind um, that permissions were going to be issued for students. And based on the students' needs that they were exhibiting in a general education kindergarten classroom, um, our students were going to need that spot. So I was reluctant in... Um, giving those spots away because I wanted to make sure that we had the supports in place in our school to support our students first. And I think that's the most important thing that we need to keep that in the front of our minds here when we're, when we're running these, these unique programs that we want to make sure that we're taking care of what our students need first. I totally concur. So yeah. Okay. I was just, yeah, I was curious because in such a small district too, there's more room for variation from year to year as to how many kids are going to need support. So there could be times in the future when 
that number could technically go down. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, No, I just wanted to... I wanted to comment that I am all for bringing our students in-house. So I really am glad that you are proposing this. And not only is it nice and feel-goody, it's also um, you know, a well-established educational best practice to have special education students in their home district. And it's the right thing to do for our kids, um, both socially and academically. So thank you for presenting this. Absolutely. And, and Mrs. McKelvey, you're right. It is what's right. So, so and th- this might be a question for Christine now, just for my understanding, because I know we're going to talk budget here eventually. But essentially, where we have listed in like 1.7 million for our the professional education 320 object that we have, um, that's where you've noted that where the IU costs are, and that 1.7 does that include that cost? So would we see a deduct from there and just a re- reallocation up into the? instructional assistant in classroom instruction? Um, I believe that those four students that she talked about that are currently outplaced, um, I don't know if they're all in IU programs, Dr. Jacoby, no? No, they're not. They would have out of district tuition of some type. It may not be in that 300 object. Um, It could be in the 500s with tuition to another, sorry, to another school district. Um, I believe she said one's in Allentown, one's in Catasauqua. So they would actually be considered tuition students versus IU. But four of the students that she's talking about tonight would come back. It would reduce costs for that. The first classroom she talked about are all new incoming kindergarten students. So they have not been anywhere in our district, you know, either tuition or so they're all. That's a whole entire new group of kids just coming in. Right. So, so in in the budget itself, would that is that included in our budget for what we're trying to prepare for, or is, is that still something we're going to have to account for? The autistic support for the kindergarten would not yet be in the budget okay. at all. Um, again, that other classroom, there would be trade offs and mm-hmm. and the transportation, as um, Mrs. Klinger mentioned you know, is something that we still have to look at. I'm not exactly sure how those four students are being transported, but that would potentially. So we actually need to sit down. Um, Dr. Jacoby and I, is a, she's away uh, this week, but she and I need to sit down next week and work through some of the details and exactly what it is going to mean in the budget. Okay. You know, and again, thank you for the work. I, I know this is tedious work, so I appreciate you being able to still take this back and keep digging. You know, appreciate all of it. Hey, Christine, just so for clarity, uh, and I'm just doing the back of the envelope here, but there's new incoming students, even though we save, at the end of the day, I think it's a net increase for total support. I'm sorry. Sudden, I'm sorry. Could you just repeat what you said at the end there? Yeah. Um, this is Sam DeFrank. I mean, when you look at the seven incoming students and then recalling students back and setting in the transitional and you do the calculations, it seems there is a, a net negative uh, effect. I mean, we it's cost avoidance in a lot of areas and for the seven and the other ones bringing money back to the district. And when you look at the numbers, it looks at the end of the day, we're still out of pocket additional money, but not as bad. Correct. And, and that, there, there will be some grant funding available because these would be new programs, particularly for that kindergarten classroom. Um, and yeah. that's all the stuff we need to sit down and look through and talk about and and, and figure out what it will. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Tracy. And thank, thank you. you to all the people who contributed to our curriculum tonight. Thank you. So I'll pass it on to Chris. I'm going to propose that we take like a three minute break, maybe reconvene at nine o'clock. <laughs>
I'm going to turn the operations committee portion of the meeting over to Mr. Freeze. All right, thank you. Um, so we have five items tonight. Um, and first, th item 3.1, which is an update from Mr. Brackett. Um, just a recap from our last meeting, um, we came away with the action item for Mr. Brackett and I think Mrs. Funy Hatton to uh, set up a meeting with Dewey Engineering uh, to come away with uh, kind of our next steps on how we were going to move forward with improving our facilities. Mr. Brackett, you want to give us an update? I, 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 I need to preface this by I'm, I'm a little disappointed in my placement. Uh, I'm a little disappointed in my placement on the, uh, on the agenda tonight. Um, you, have a, you, have me following, you have me following an update of a phenomenal reading program being introduced to the district. Um, that and then followed by uh, potentially significant cost savings and bringing children back into our buildings. So now you come to me. Um, the later you are in the meeting, the faster you talk. <laughs> so what back is? to follow. Okay. Um, we Bill, after, you uh, really after, do need, Bill, you need to use the microphone because the people at home can't hear. That's the problem. Mouth, I'll, use, I'll use what I got. Thank you. They can't hear you at home. I know. Um, Following our uh, discussion last, uh, last month, we, um, uh, Ms. Uh, for Whitney, uh, for Whitney Hatton and I sat down with Dewey to try to get an understanding what our best next step is to bring you, uh, basically introduce you to Dewey at that point and figure out where we needed to go. So in that conversation, we figured out we probably, our best step is to uh, try to narrow down the overall scope of what we're looking to do. So. Uh, are we doing renovations? Are we building new buildings? Just trying to narrow down the scope based upon the overall um, borrowing capacity. So I don't know if you have the slides to throw up there, Lynn. Sure I can. So we'll talk about uh, new building construction, and there's really two options on, on new building construction. One is a K-5 to elementary building, so you're replacing. Ultimately, you're looking to replace Salisbury Elementary School um, on 2023 money. So you've got to look at ahead. In, in reality, we should be looking ahead two to three years, not just one year. But we're going to look ahead just one year. If we were to make this decision and start looking at what we're going to need for money to build a, a, a suitable building, to outfit a K-5, to you're really looking at bottom line of approximately $53.3 million to build a brand new building. The other option would be to replace the middle school and just do, uh, just do slight modifications on the uh, on current Salisbury Elementary and to build a building suitable for to outfit our students' needs, pushing them forward for the next 20 years in curriculum, you're looking at approximately $50.2 million. These, these prices could obviously adjust up or down depending on how markets go, supply chains go, cost of uh, building construction and labor and everything else. Uh, obviously, those, those can be adjusted considerably, but right now, that's what it looks like. And the expectation is over the next year or two, it's going to be pretty strong right to that point. Um, Bill, that's not taking into account, like, if we do one of the buildings or the other buildings, not what we have to do to the other building, correct? Right. So that's just a new building cost, nothing else. That is correct. That yeah. is not touching. So there is additional costs on top of that to or keep our other buildings up to speed. Okay. Correct. It's all greenfield construction at this point, when opposed to brownfield. Correct. Okay. So the next slide is the bad news, I'm sorry. And if you go back to the PFM conversation in January, you dizzy, sorry. where they laid out your borrowing capacity for the next couple of years, your net remaining borrowing capacity in the dark blue line towards the bottom of the page is 48 point, and we'll even, we'll just round it up, 48.5 million. So basically what I'm asking you this evening is are you interested in narrowing down the potential scope of work and eliminating the possibility of a new building off as an option. This will help us focus with Dewey and bringing the small group of, uh, of members uh, to the table with Dewey to start finalizing exactly what we want to do to the, remain, or to the existing buildings on a renovation level. That's the conversation I'm asking for. Right, so, so, 
this is kind of a big decision, so I don't want to just immediately like knee jerk say the number is higher than that number. Take let's take it off the table. Um, the numbers that and Lynn, if you can go back to the other number as well, which was fifty and fifty two, I believe those for the for the new bill, yeah, fifty three and fifty, call it. Those are how. How reliable do you think those numbers are? Those numbers are based on current projects that are in process or just got done bidding from Dewey, uh, from Dewey Engineering. Because the reason I, ha I asked that question is Dewey's giving us numbers based on knowing how much of what we want. Like, if we, if we, did, we, did you say to them, what would it cost to build a new K through 5? And but they don't know what that looks like. Well, what we, we did it on a square footage basis. That's perfect. Per square foot per student, what is the cost of current construction today in or near the Lehigh Valley? Yeah. So it's only per square footage cost. Obviously, you can, as you start trying to narrow down uh, exactly what you want for a brand new building, are your classrooms changing? Do you need as many classrooms as you have? Do you need more classrooms than you have? What does that floor plan look like? Do you need... Do you need 20 full-size classrooms, or can you narrow them down because your special education or specialties require a smaller room? So there's ways to change that, but to, suffice, to go square footage by square footage of what we have today, yeah. as a decent measurement, those are your numbers. Yep. Is it, is it realistic to assume that once you actually get into the detail that the number would go up or down? Like that potentially, it could potentially go either way. But as you're, you're trying to, right now you're looking at a square footage building that was built in either the late 60s or 70s, and you're trying to make that meet for current curriculum. You want to push your next building, if you're going to design a, next, a new building, you want to make sure that building's going to push your curriculum for the next 20 yeah. to 30 years. It's likely, because of the designs you want to bring into it, it's going to push it higher. Mm -hmm. Never seen one of those numbers go down. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I, I, that, that's my assumption, yeah. but I, mm -hmm. I'm trying to point that out. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. I would say uh, even if everything goes perfectly, right, and these numbers drop by 20%, right, we're still looking at getting close to our maximum borrowing capacity just to build one school, leaving us, and if, if I recall, the last time we got an estimate, it didn't include things like all the innards, right? It was just the building. I gave you a, uh, a, a the, uh, at the presentation, I gave you the bare minimums that would need to be done. Okay. Um, and that doesn't account for any of the aesthetics in either one of the two mm -hmm. buildings. So you've gotten this, you, you're getting the same exact looking building. <laughs> just know that your mechanical systems behind them are being, are, are strong. Yeah. I mean, it just, it seems to me extraordinarily irresponsible to get anywhere close to our maximum borrowing capacity on one single building when we're going to be left with another building that needs a lot of work and we need to fill up the new building with either new stuff or all of our old crap, right? And so <laughs> I, I, I just, I, unless somebody has some sort of insight that I am not capable of seeing, it seems to me that both of these options are, are a no-go. It, the one thing we, you know, take in consideration, I concur. I mean, if you take the 30% uh, out, you're at 41 million and 39 million, uh, which is almost, you know, 80% uh, more of our borrowing capacity, which I concur. But we have to understand if you do a renovation, uh, it is going to be extremely disruptive uh, to our learning environment as we get into it. And it's gonna take longer. Uh, at least the last that's we got, uh, the, the fastest is to go greenfield. Uh, the longer construction uh, will be uh, renovation. So we just have to be prepared for that. And finance is one thing, but the other one is understanding what we're getting into as far as timeline and disruption to learning for our students. Hey, can, I, can I make a comment quick while I'm here? Please. Um, I just, you know, listening to this, um, I understand some of the situation we're in as far as our facilities, but, um, and maybe it was prior to my time on the board, but uh, my curiosity is, what is our ongoing plan, even if we were to build new, which I don't believe we can afford, um, 
that's years out. And we have facilities that are in uh, conditions now that we're not maintaining. So what is the plan regardless of building new? Because even if we did that, we still have to maintain what we have and make sure it's acceptable. So what's the plan there? <laughs> I mean, building new and throwing money at a new building isn't necessarily the solution. I'm just curious what, what, what was planned out as far as fixing what we have. And, and to be clear, we're not proposing we choose one of these. We're hoping the the board um, comes to the same conclusion that we came to, that we can't afford to do this and we need to take it off the table and focus on re renovation or bare minimum repairs or you know some combination of, of the two. Yeah, one, one thing to add here, as we said, th this would be for greenfield construction. Keep in mind, based off of what land we have, we would have to, you know, remove a building. So keep that in mind, too. I mean, we're probably talking somewhere in between 50 to 150 just to tear a building down in order to make the available space for it, too. That would be on top of these numbers, which even makes it even worse. Well, and there's a lot more on top of these numbers that we haven't presented, but this is already out of out of um, the realm. Yep. All right, tell me the difference between Greenfield and Brownfield. Okay, so, so Greenfield assumes that you've done no site development at all. So it's literally like a green grass field as you look at the plains, right? Mm -hmm. Now a Brownfield example would be if we went down and we leveled one of the buildings down. We've already ripped up the dirt, we've already developed it itself. So it's already a pre-developed site, but you still have work to do in it. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hopeful. So really what we're looking for tonight and um, is us to determine if, if you, the board agrees with the place that we've landed and then to identify our next steps, bring some of the board members in, meet with Dewey and start the conversation of, you know, here's what we can here's what we can get for this much money, how much money do we really want to look at? And it's not just about borrowing the money, but we have to figure out how we're going to pay the money back. Yeah. And you know, with a $1.8 million deficit right now, how are we going to build $1.5 million of extra debt service in? Yeah. Into Le less than that, but yes, I mean that's what we would be looking at. Um, so you know, that's a bigger part of the part of the challenge. So um, you know, we we certainly can it will make it an easier task for the group to focus on the renovation task or the or the bare minimum repairs, you know, what, what we choose to do and, and the aesthetics to go with it. And then one thing I just wanted to mention, and for Tom's sake, because he brought up a good question, we had went through this discussion before, Tom, and we had a group come in and they gave us uh, five different proposals, which was new renovation and they put a price tag to each of them. And it's been a while, so that information is dated. And what we're doing here is giving a, I guess, a reality check of what new is. And pretty much what Lynn's asking that that's off the board and go back to our other proposals, which would be renovation and determining what can we afford and what can we do for the money we can afford to borrow and pay back. So that's why new was discussed and reviewed because it was one of the options that was discussed five years ago. And Sam, I, I can tell you, I really wanted to see new myself, but you know, I'm, I concur with everyone saying here. It's just unfortunate reality of the times. Yep, I concur. This is clear. Did you, did you have anything you wanted to? Add? I wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to weigh in. No, but, I agree. Okay. It would be great, but doesn't look like it's possible. One thing I would like to request, if we do in fact decide to throw this off the table, the PFM scenario, the debt schedules that they provided to us mm -hmm. are all large borrowing amounts. You know, the, the, the lowest is $48 million. Um, Are we able to get debt schedules for, you know, whatever, I, whatever you deem sure. would be appropriate? We did this so that we could show, okay. we chose high okay. to show high. I understand. And okay. how we would build, how it would be difficult to build the debt okay. service in. Okay. So we can certainly do that down the road. Okay. As we need to. I assume we would be able to model it against what we actually think we're going to need. Or a few scenarios to give us, you know, we can't, we definitely can't build this debt service in or, you know, maybe three three scenarios like we did here. Yeah, you could look at, look at the $48 million debt service and I think, like Mr. Free says, if you did $30 million, do 30 over 48, multiply by the number to give you a ballpark, take it down to 20, any number you want to look at. I mean, I think there's a minimum of $10 million to go to the market and do it economically. And there may, might be some breaks 
uh, uh, that are not calculated, but just for ballpark and looking at what the cost would be and see if we can afford it, you could use that scenario. And just to um, one final point of clarification to be transparent, every year we lose some debt, right? We pay some interest and we lose, is it about $2 million? We're paying $2 million in principal. In principal. That's what I meant. I said interest. So, so even though we are where we are right now, next year, you know, we're $2 million lower. But that's still not, that's still not where we need to be. So just want to be, just want to clarify that point, too, so people understand that. So it sounds like we have a consensus to move towards the step that we thought we were going to move towards last, last meeting, after last meeting, and we have a more focused conversation. And just to be clear, do we, we expect to be able to have that discussion before our next working session? We will do our best to schedule with Dewey. Yep. Yep. We'll s I, I'm going to say potentially, and the reason I'm going to throw that in is we do have PASBO's uh, annual conference next week. Okay. Dewey's involved with that conference. Mm -hmm. They're out of their office for the next, for the three or four days of that next week. Um, as well as, I'm, uh, as I am, we will certainly make that happen as quickly as we can. Um, and make sure that we have everybody uh, involved uh, at that particular point. But it, there is a potential of it not happening before our next meeting. Yeah. OK. Anyone have any other questions? I don't know if this is it, but just a reminder that the middle school has never been totally renovated like the elementary or the high school. Mm -hmm. So we need to prioritize. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That was just an added. Yeah, note. we still have padded think... walls in the middle school. <laughs> Sometimes middle schoolers need padded. <laughs> I think we want to get rid of it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brackett. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. All right. Um, next item is. Uh, oh, double check here. Uh, we're on to the budget update, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Okay, uh, first of all, I apologize. I had fully intended tonight, as I said last month, to have some uh, forecast projections, a five-year, and unfortunately, uh, the company that we work with, they're going through what everybody else is, is that they've had staffing changes, and our representative was promoted within the company, and they don't have a real replacement yet for him. And so, needless to say, they were not able to provide that for me. So, um, I did spend some time over the uh, uh, president's holiday weekend going back through uh, the large areas of the budget and just re-verifying, um, looking at staffing, um, trying to identify you know positions that may or may not become vacant or retirements or if we've had some a couple of resignations at this point. Started making some notes of some places. Um, to make changes in the budget. Unfortunately, there, there really are not a lot at this point in time. Um, this is going to be very difficult, this $1.8 million, I will say. It's, there's just not a lot in the budget that you can just go in and say, we can get rid of that and we can get rid of that. It's just not, not the kind of budget that it is. Um, looking at our assessed value um, also became a bit concerning. That is not moving at all and we, um, Right now, uh, when you have your board agenda later this uh, month, when you vote in two weeks, we will have some more um, stipulations for assessment appeals, but we're also getting them coming at us again where people are filing to have, have a hearing for an assessment appeal. So I don't see a lot happening in terms of growth in the, um, in the assessment base, which, as we all know, unfortunately, is the only source of revenue that school districts can use. So. <coughs> Um, I certainly will be keeping my eyes and ears peeled to, you know, find some creative ways to look for revenue um, because it is going to be very difficult on the expenditure side. But can I can I just ask one question? Sure. Any, I'm sure that I know the answer to this, but any any movement on the hospital issue, the High Valley Health Network appeal? Um, uh, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think about what I want to share publicly. Um, but I think that suffices for now, no. Okay. Just as we're looking for potential mm -hmm. resources. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Yes, the, and thanks for that reminder, too. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to present to you tonight just, you know, another way of looking at um, what, what the budget does entail, um, just with some pie charts. Um, 
salaries and benefits, which, you know, uh, obviously are a big chunk of the total overall budget, are about 63% of that total $42 million number are salary and benefits and our staffing. And you know, again, that's not unusual for a school district. We don't produce widgets, so we don't buy raw materials. We produce educated children, and that takes, that takes staffing. So... Um, that's not at all unusual to see that that large of a percentage is there. Um, our debt service um, transfers, um, our debt service in, is another big chunk of it. Other purchased services, the 500s, and I'm going to go through and break these down a little bit further, but 18% of our budget is 500s, and when we get to that, you'll see that most of that is either tuition for out-of-district students, as we just discussed, charter school tuition, and student transportation. Those are the three things that make up that biggest chunk that's 18% of our budget in those 500s. Um, so again, if we if we start to look at the pieces, the first page is the salary and benefits, um, and I've just broken it down. Um, these object codes are are how we code various categories of people, such as administration, the instructional assistants, the classroom instruction, um, you know, clerical maintenance, whatnot. So those are the percentages that basically make up that chunk of uh, the budget that's salaries. Uh, most of it, again, in classroom instruction or um, teachers. The um, benefits part of it, PCERS and um, medical actually take up the two biggest chunks of that. Um, this does show, as, as I'm sure most of you are aware, we are required to pay both our share of Social Security and retirement, and then the state reimburses us 50% of each of those, which shows on the revenue side. So, you know, really it's when you, when you look at the percentage of the budget, those are skewed because we do, and, and of course they do count that in as part of basic education funding to schools, even though it's their obligation that we pay and they reimburse us, it is included in what they consider as basic education funding for schools. So it's, it's sort of that game, that shuffling game that, uh, but that's just something to keep in mind. Is that, that sarcasm uh, I sense? <laughs> Pardon? Is that sarcasm I sense? Did you notice it? <laughs> yes. Christine, just one quick question. When you're saying that, so essentially where it shows this is roughly $6.7 million that we have for Social Security and PEASERS, there's roughly three and a half, like three and a half, 3.3 million on the revenue so side. So it would come back also. on the revenue okay. side, correct, yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, the, the rest of them are all uh, smaller amounts of workers' compensation actually came up as a zero because it's such a small amount. And we have, you know, tuition reimbursement for those teachers who are uh, finalizing certification needs and, and that type of thing. They're all quite small amounts, so most of that. Um, the two tens, which um, are marked as medical, that's actually um, all kinds of insurance, health insurance, dental insurance, life insurance, long-term disability, they're all lumped into that 210 category. Um, and that is still budgeted at a 12% increase. Uh, I just had a meeting last week, our actual final number was 12.02%, but I ran it and it was like a couple thousand dollars different, so I'm, I'm actually not gonna change the budget. There are enough fluctuations in and out during the year that I'm just going to leave it at the 12% increase. Um, the 300 objects, um, the largest portion of that is the 320. Again, that is primarily IU services. Um, so out of that total 2.5 million um, part of the budget, um, a good chunk of that does go to the IU. Um, the other part, the non-educational professional services, the 330, that's 17% of the budget. That's things like our legal services, our medical services, uh, where we contract with doctors and dentists and, and those different kinds of professionals, but they're not providing an educational service. Safety and security is about 9% of that 2.5 million out of the budget, and that includes our crossing guards and our SROs that we contract through the township. Um, in the 400 categories, which are purchased property services, this is an area I need to spend some more time digging a little, a little bit more in to see um, exactly um, what some of the things are there and just to make sure that we're on track with what we should be budgeting for um, what we call repairs. It's identified as repairs. It actually includes like um, contracted companies that Mr. Brackett would have coming in to do preventive maintenance on 
uh, heating systems, air conditioning systems, that kind of thing, as well as um, like the, uh, the agreements that we have for maintenance on our copy machines, our printers, some of our technology equipment is all, it's considered under repairs. It all goes in that 430 category. Um, the 440s, that's rental of all kinds of things. Um, if we need to get a bucket truck to do something on the roof, we might have to rent it. Some of it um, relates to graduation expenses. They all rent a facility to have the graduation, ex you know, that type of thing. There's all kinds of different areas with that rental category. Um, the water and sewer is another thing I want to kind of take a look at because I thought that seemed a little bit high out of 500,000 to be at 11%. So. I'll have to run some diagnostic numbers on that. To... Christine, j just one question. I, I know we, we put the preliminary budget together originally that we passed for the um, for you guys to go for the exceptions. How did these account codes align to those activities that are listed in that prelim budget? That is where these come from. It is? Yes. Okay. Yes, they are. Yes. And since you brought that up, I hadn't thought about it, but I did um, go in and fill out the referendum exception, and it came out exactly as I expected, that we don't qualify for anything, as most school districts are not. So so we are looking at needing to, to adjust by the $1.8 There would not be any exceptions available. And thank you for reminding me of that, because I had tried to forget it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wish I didn't remind you. Yeah. Oh. Okay, then when we get to the 500 object, again, as I mentioned earlier, the majority of that is tuition. Um, it's charter school tuition. It is um, uh, out of district student uh, tuition, you know, various things like that. And again, if they're in an IU program, that's a contracted service because they're one of our entities. If it's if they're like an individual student at another school district or whatever, that's an individual contract and that's considered tuition. Um, uh, the charter school thing is another thing that I'm continuing to work on. We did have five students in dispute um, where we were questioning um, whether they actually were residents of our district. One of them has been resolved and removed from our billing uh, in, a, in a cyber charter program. There are still three that I'm working with our SRO to continue to investigate um, whether they in fact are living within the boundaries of our district or not. And the other one is just an interesting anomaly that uh, the assessment, Lehigh County Assessment Office says the property address is in the city of Allentown, but the municipal statistics website says that it's in Salisbury Township School District, so we're having to work through, um, you know, where, where it really is. And typically we win based on the assessment record because that's where the taxes are paid, so... I have a question. So what percentage of that tuition is um, charter school, would you say? Um... Let me see if I can tell that on here. Should have known you would ask. I believe that it's something close to three million, but don't quote me on that until I see if I can look it up here. I know we keep beating this drum, but I think it's so important for people to understand that there's our budget deficit and then some. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right there. Yeah. You know? I don't have it broken out. The total tuition amount is $4.7 million, but as, again, that includes those uh, tuition students. To, I believe that the charter school is right around $3 million at this point is what I'm projecting. Yeah. 1.8 versus 3. There we are right there. So, um, Where does our payment to LCTI fall? Uh, that also is, is tuition. Okay. Yes. Yes. And L-TRI-C as well. Okay. They, they are in that tuition category. Um, transportation, which is 33% of that 7.6 million, and that, that includes fuel. That's our uh, contract with the, our, uh, our trans student transportation contractor, as well as the fuel that all the buses use, which, as we all know, of going to the uh, pumps lately, I'm hoping that I projected a high enough increase in that area because buses are not exactly fuel efficient, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, the 600 objects, and this is the one that, this is sort of like, if you're not sure where you code something, they put it under a general supply. <laughs> so general supplies can look like it's a very large number, but it's made up literally of like thousands of, of small things that, that accumulate into that. Uh, it's everything from a pencil to a, a CD player that might be used in the classroom that's not actually considered a piece of equipment if it's a low enough cost. So there, there's a, a large area of uh, things that are in that 32% that shows as a general supply. 
We do split out our software licensing, which also is in the 610, but we, we put an eight at the end of that to identify that that's uh, not a consumable material per se. It is the licensing for the, all the various different softwares that we have. Um, energy is the largest part of this. All of your electric um, heating uh, fuels, gas, all of that type of thing all fall into that energy category, which is 41% of the, the 600s. I should have asked Bill this before he left, but <laughs> are all our buildings heated the same way or differently? I believe they're all gas now. The elementary school, when I was here many years ago, was, was electric, but I know we did a... Yeah, it's gas. It's gas now, yeah. Okay. That's an area when I was com doing some comparison there. It's, it's a little hard to compare because of being shut down for COVID. Yeah. Um, you know, we really didn't end up using all of the budget in that year, but I don't know where we're going to end up with this year's yet, but that's a little one that's a little difficult to, to predict. Christine, do, do we, does like the cafeteria's uh, gas consumption, is that built separately or is that included in that number? That would be included in that number, everything in the building. Um, at one time, we did break some of that stuff out, um, but as cafeterias become less and less profitable, that kind of went by the wayside. Okay. Because um, then we would just end up subsidizing them back, so. All right. <laughs> um, equipment, the, there's very little anymore that we actually call equipment. Um, because the cost of stuff has gotten under the capitalization threshold, a lot of it, so it's actually considered a supply. Uh, but we do have $37,000 that uh, various departments have put in. Uh, whether that will actually end up being coded out as equipment or not, it may end up flipping over as a supply. But um, again, that's just 37000 out of the total budget. Our other objects, that's mostly the interest on our debt service uh, is in there. There also is 15% of that is the contingency fund, um, and that is a um, budgetary reserve is what it will tell you in the official budget document. That is money that um, should be budgeted off your fund balance. It's really just for unanticipated things, you know, increases in charter school students, you know, a, a major building repair that has to be done that can't be covered under the facilities budget, that type of thing. Um, <coughs> And again, if, if you don't use it, it, it would just roll back into fund balance. It does actually require board action to move it out of. Um, so if, if at the end of the year it hasn't been used, it just rolls back into fund balance. If at the end of the year it would need to be used, then it requires board action to... Do we, do we know historically what we've, what we've done with that contingency? Like have... I, I don't know. I could tell you when I was here before, it was only at 150000 and we, we never used it. But typically, the board would make a motion at the end of the year to move it to the capital improvement fund. Yeah. 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 I'm, just, I'm just curious if we've exceeded it or, or what. Yeah, okay. yeah I'm not All sure. Right. I'm not sure about that in recent years. But um, Typically, that's what, when I was here, I always recommended that the board, if we didn't need to use it for operations, that they would then move it to capital improvement, uh, which is a separate, you know, capital account that we maintain for projects. Um, and the 900s is the other side of our debt service. That's the principal amount. And right now, we do have budgeted $100,000 fund transfer to food service. Um, we're waiting on a new proposal. Yes from the um, company that we outsource with. So we'll see what they're um, projecting as far as profits or loss as to whether that might be an area that we can make some changes in the budget. But that's typically what's been in the budget the last couple of years, so I left it that way until we get that new proposal from them. I don't believe that this year, based on what they're telling us anyway, that we will need it from this year's budget. Correct, they're telling us, we we're, they're anticipating a profit this year. Um, but they did talk, when I talked with them uh, about the renewal, they did talk about a 30% increase in costs and, and food and, um, you know, not increasing their administrative fees, but that we would be expecting to see something different for next year. We don't have that document yet. Christine, this is Sam DeFrank, and I have to apologize. I can't see your slides. They sound fantastic and very uh, thorough. I did drop uh, them in the chat, um, Sam. Okay. Great. Well, the question I have is where is the line for 
the building of fund balance, where does that fall into the quarter million dollars that we were looking to increase our reserves? I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not following what you're asking. The contingency, I think, is what Sam's alluding to. I, the budgetary yeah. reserve. Yeah, yeah. Because we were, uh, is that the quarter million that's in there you talked about? That Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. yes. So we were allocating that into a rebuild fund balance uh, and trying to get that back to Hardy. That was that what that is being utilized for. Yeah, I'm, I'm still not sure I'm following. Was this a prior discussion or? Yeah, I, I think it, this goes back to the debt restructure, right, Sam? <laughs> Yes. Oh, yes. the debt we restructure. We decided we're going to try to start to rebuild our fund balance because we had used it. Yes. And we're putting a quarter million dollars to rebuild fund balance. That's where that money is. And so that was going to go into our reserve fund uh, and, and not be utilized for anything else, but rebuild that to help us with our uh, allocation of debt because we need to improve it to get a better rate on our debt service. So that was the beginning of... Uh, restoring our fund balances, and that's what that was set there for. Yes, I, I do know what you're talking about now. The debt restructuring amount is in debt service. It, it's incorporated in with the debt service amount. And it's 300? Was it 300? Uh, I think it's a little bit more than that. Okay. Um, I would have to give that number. Okay. I think it might be on the PF, some of that PFM stuff. I don't think it's the one the one we were looking at, though. Mm -hmm. I would have to get that off the PFM presentation okay. they had done at the time you did that, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Yep. So, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I, 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 I think Sam's going back to the point where we were talking about putting more money back into fund balance to establish our, our, our credit rating. Correct. Make sure that's, mm -hmm. that's where he, just so we're all on the same page. Yes, um, exactly. exactly, and there was a plan that we all agreed to to have that as a line in our budget to rebuild our fund balance that we had. You know, first we said we're not going to borrow any more fund balance or use it. And then two, we said we have to rebuild it to help our borrowing costs going forward. So well, you got it, Jim. I guess what Sam is asking is in these pie charts here, where does that two hundred fifty or 300000 fall? It's in with the debt service. It's, okay. scheduled, it's scheduled as if you would be paying that as debt service, but it will well, we're actually... We're paying ourselves. You'll be paying yourselves, correct. Correct. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. yes. So, like, under the interest uh, object or one of these would... Part of it would be, it would be whatever those debt service payments were going to be for that year. Um, that's actually in the current year budget as well. It was a two-year two year phase in. Yeah, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head what the breakdown is, but yeah, that's... All right, I have a very high-level general question, okay? <laughs> uh, a year or two ago, I actually went and calculated per capita for every like per student cost for every district in the county. And, you know, I've recently seen like the uh, Circle of Seasons tuition costs, which, you know, are based on per student um, costs. And we, we appear to continue to be the highest district in the county for per student costs. It would seem to me from this pie chart that the implication is it must mean we're overstaffed because if we're paying more than anybody else in the county and a majority of our costs are in staffing, it, the, the, the logical conclusion is that we have too much staff. Now, is there another way to read the situation? And I understand that, that we have some oddities with our size and things like that, but Catasauqua, for example, when I ran the numbers, we're paying $8,000 per student less, and they are exactly the same size we are in terms of student population. So why do we spend so much money? I, I guess is basically what my question is. I read that as people come to work here and they stay here. And, and that is a good point. Um, the majority of our professional staff are at the top of the salary scale. They are, which I believe is 15 steps. Yes, I've, but it takes masters plus forty-five to get there, but there are fifteen steps. But there's kind of their freezes and whatnot in there, so I don't recall how many years it actually takes them to get there. But I think it's fifteen right now. I don't know that. Well, there was just a freeze, though. <laughs> right, that's not fair. Yeah, we just took a freeze, so it would have been that sixteen. Adds, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. 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 Used to be 14. Yeah. I think it takes more like about 18 years to get to the yeah. Is that comparable to districts in the area? I, that I don't know. Oh, fair I enough. Know. <laughs> fair enough. I know. I'm just like throwing that at you. Yeah. yeah. Would, it, would, it be, would it be possible to see uh, a summary of staffing at, at some point to see in each building how many teachers at each level we have and compare that to sections? Because I, th I think Laura brings up a good point that to be the highest there, I don't think we can attribute that just because our teachers don't leave. I think that's a common scenario throughout education right now. So I'd be interested to see those if the rest of the board would as well. We're working on that for April. We were hoping to have it done for March, but then we want to look at projections and we want to look at the budget because a proposal for next year is that's, you know, indicative of what, where we need to reduce. I like these pie charts. Oh, thank you. I really understand this. Yeah, they, were, they were very helpful. <laughs> thank you. Anyone have any more questions for Ms. Stanford? Great work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll move on then to the health and safety plan update. Um, Mrs. Puny Hatton. Sure. I'll start that. Um, I'm not sure why I'm getting this because I. Kelly, can you look and set it to everybody? Maybe, maybe. Mine says the authentication to the server. Yeah, it's lost. the do. Yeah, oh, mine's up. Let me get it. Did you try the other? The other laptop. She's got to do one. Do you want to? Do you want to? Sure. Yeah. If you want to share it, that would be great. I can only. You got to stop sharing. This one has to stop sharing first. She's gonna pull one out from under the the table and try that. <laughs> Oh, okay. So quick. Um, yes. Boardroom. Code comes in. Yep. Six five zero eight. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. We love when you learn new things. All right, so just um, a quick update tonight and then a conversation for the board. Um, where we are right now, our cases are have significantly decreased. You've probably seen it on the dashboard. This is the data from yesterday uh, when I finalized this for board members. Um, two cases, two cases, and I actually think we took one off the board today, so we're at zero in the elementary building. Yes. So here's where we are right now. We're still in tier one. If you remember, um, after we approved this, I sent out an update on the Friday and told families we'll send out another update in two weeks to let you know where we are. I sent that out Sunday afternoon so families know that we're still in tier one. Um, just a point of reference, the incident rate has significantly decreased. This is from um, the 24th. So that cases per 100,000 has significantly decreased as well. You've probably seen the information about the CDC revised guidance. This is just a point of information. Um, CDT, CDC is now looking at three different metrics. Um, so new COVID admissions per 100, thousand population um, in the past seven days, percent of staffed inpatient beds, and total new COVID-19 cases per 100,000 population. This is just a point of, you've probably seen it in the news, I'm not suggesting we make any changes based on this, just yes, I'm aware the CDC has changed. Um, they are now utilizing three different levels, low, medium, and high, based on those data points. I have linked uh, the information there. We are currently in medium. Um, those are the recommendations when you're in medium. That link there, community county level, lets you go out and look at where you are. I just copied and pasted from the website, and it's updated um, once a week. Uh, this is a larger view of what's recommended for each of these. You see that the CDC now require, now recommends you wear a mask indoors in public when we're in high. 
So a couple of things to think about. Um, over, the, over the weekend, CDC also indicated that they were not going to enforce the mandate for uh, masks on public transportation. So I interpreted that as the board um, intended to provide that matrix so that administrators could make decision. And in the transportation section, we had the information about uh, CDC requirement for masks on transportation. Um, I interpreted that the board <laughs> would agree with the fact that we would move to our tier implementation for masks on transportation, and I communicated that uh, to families and want to know if the board wants to update the matrix, if the board wants to um, make any changes to the matrix regarding that for transportation. Also, we have, we were intentional about recommended. Does the board want to make any change in language from recommended to optional? And um, finally there today, there was a district safety committee meeting that uh, Mr. Brackett led, and our nurses requested that um, students only need to wear masks when they're symptomatic in the nurse's office. We have a lot of students who visit for a lot of different reasons, and um, they don't feel the need with the case count where we are. So I reached out to our athletic trainers because that's also in that section, and um, they indicated they would be comfortable with the same thing, and that it's actually a challenge because Kids haven't worn the mask all day, and then they come in and they don't have a mask, and we're handing them out, and it's just sort of a logistical challenge that we didn't expect. And with the case counts, um, they're comfortable moving to optional. And if anything else that the board wants to make a make a change to, um, if you do want to make changes, I can make them and bring them to the board on the next board meeting. Sure. All right. Should we? I guess we'll go around then. Get any any thoughts? Anybody? Want to jump in, or do you want me to go alphabetical? We can do that. Anybody have any initial thoughts they want to share? I think it makes sense. If they're removing the mandate, we should, from a consistency standpoint, just go right back to, to the tiers and just follow it. Follow the same rules, except, you know, um, I guess tier two, I guess, would be a bit of a sticking because that's only on transportation. But what are you, what are you recommending specifically? That, the line where we have transportation. We don't, basically, we, uh, we don't have a... That? Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah. We, we don't have a, where it's required, because right now on the matrix on the bottom it says it's required because of the yeah. mandate, right? You would, I would think you'd extract that language and say follow the tiers that we have. If we're in tier one, tier two, tier three, you follow those based off the metrics. That's probably more words than needed to be to say that. However, <laughs> basically what we've done, what I've interpreted, put it in writing and and Bring it to the board. I would treat the bus like a classroom, yep. like it's. So is 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 it is it the transition state? Like tier two would be would be the like the equivalent of the transition. Is that what you're saying? So we would still be in the recommend the recommended or the required. I think that's the one that's open for. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Do we need to? Right, because we've got we've got tier two. We've got the the hallway scenario. Right. There we go. I. So I agree with that assessment. So essentially, tier one, tier two are the same. They're recommended. No, I'm sorry. Mm -mm. Tier two would be just recommended. I'm asking the opposite, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, it's late. <laughs> oh, understood. No, that's why I wanted to be yeah. clear. Yeah. I'm good with you, Chris. Well, in, if you think about it, if, if we are requiring them during arrival, dismissal, and transition, then it makes sense. You, you have it on the bus or you... Um, you know, don't. I also reached out to the bus garage and the bus drivers were, um, and the director of operations, um, Joanna, my gosh, I'm blanking her last name. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, was in support of removing, you know, that for the, for the buses as well. Um, I'd like to suggest that we update the language for our nursing suites and athletic trainers, especially since they requested How do the building leaders that change. feel about that? Hmm? How do the building leaders feel about that, Lynn? I haven't talked to the building leaders about it, to be honest. They, they were copied on the email from the nurses with the request. Mm -hmm. So I, 
knowing our administrators, if they did have a concern, <laughs> we would have we would know about it now. <laughs> silence, silence means consent. Is that word? No, no I, I would be in support of it as well as long as the building, the, the principals and building leaders are, are in support of it. So that that would be my personal feeling. Yeah, I mean, I think it also matches up with the guidance from the yeah. CDC that symptomatic, you wear a mask. Okay, so I think I'm understanding we want to update the language in the nursing suite to match tier one, um, two, and, and three, and we want to update the transportation. The one point I'm not clear on no, is... No, no, I, actually, no, nursing suite is not matching tier one, two, and three. It's any time they're symptomatic. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Tier one. Yeah, I mean, if somebody's yeah. for, for, for tier one, right? For the okay. Two, it would be required. Okay. I can get a draft and out to everybody to review too. And I think for the busing, you have to actually update the health and safety plan itself too, right? There's, there's. We'll we'll update both documents. Yep. Okay. Any. Any other thought? I, my, my only other note is that just based on the fact that we did have a little bit of confusion, we might we might want to just clarify going forward which which aspects of this. I don't know. I don't know how we do that, but which aspects of this require board action versus our interpretation? I think in terms of like it was clear to me like moving between the matrix was like an actionable thing that the administration. But so mm -hmm. maybe we. I don't know how we address that, but yeah, just... and part of that is, you know, I take accountability for part of that because I, you know, reached out to you guys individually over the some of you individually over the weekend, intending to inform Lynn of the board's will, but I didn't say that out loud. So this is a practice that we've done before, and I just didn't, in the moment, didn't do a full explanation. So I take responsibility for. Yeah, that and also. to be clear, I don't mind what actually occurred. It just. Yeah. Procedurally, it was problematic, and, and that was the real concern, because it was, the way I read it, it was a policy change, and, and then the procedure wasn't followed, you know, and, and, and I understand you interpreted it differently, and, you know, so I appreciate that. Okay. We'll be more diligent in the future. Yeah, it's, it's not, it wasn't my intention to implement anything that the board didn't, yeah. <laughs> didn't support. Like, we spent a lot of time talking about this. We needed to get clarity out to the community, because I'm sure we, there were probably questions about it regardless, so I think we needed to. There were questions, and particularly because I was due to send an update on the tier, it was, there were more questions. Yeah. Great. No, good. Anybody have any other comments? No? All right. All right. Thank you, Ben. Um, My only comment is that was the shortest health and safety conversation we've ever had. <laughs> Do not jinx us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, someone else asked a question. Then. All right, uh, we'll move on then. Uh, next two items, uh, 3.4, 3.5. Mr. Smith over here. Um, we'll start with a proposal for a backup software called BackUFI. I think I said backup UFI. Backup. Back up five. I said, I, I, I've been trying to say that all day. Uh, followed by an update on our E rate program. Uh, you want to start with the first one? Yeah. Yep. All right. I was going to just drive, but you're fine. Now. Go ahead and do it for me. I, mean, so move I will, yes. That when the next slide Don't pops worry, up, it I, means I, you're done. I move along very quickly. Um, so I want to. Why are they laughing? Place, um, starting as soon as possible, is a program called Backupify. And what it does is it essentially is a better system what we're currently using for backing up our Google workspace. So all of our files inside our Google domain, uh, mail, our shared drives, uh, calendar, and contacts. So that's essentially what it does for us. Um, everything that we do have out there currently is backed up through a system called Vault that is part of the Google Suite. The problem with it is when you need to go and restore something, it's kind of cumbersome. Like you can restore the files back, but you lose a lot of the folder structure, the file folder structure, uh, as well as permissions. So in a large scale, issue where a large file folder got deleted with all the files in there, you're talking about going through and trying to restore them and then get them 
set properly within where they need to be in the file tree, and then also restoring those permissions. And that's provided there wasn't any kind of ransomware attack where you got to go into revision history. Um, and so that's where I also talk about the whole idea of ransomware protection. With Google Vault, that's kind of lacking. It's there, but you're reliant on version history. And certain files, when you put them inside Google, you're not going to have a version history. Like a PDF, you're just uploading that file there. There is no version history. It's just kind of like, oh, here's a copy. You don't see any everything that you've done previously to be able to revert back to something. <laughs> Um, and then also that kind of goes into the whole idea of the ease of use. It's not a very useful program for being able to restore from uh, quickly. Um, so we can jump to the next one. So what Backupify does is it'll go through and back up all of our Google Drive data after that first time through. It'll probably take about, they estimate, two to three days to get everything inside our drive backed up onto their system as well. And then they'll just do the incrementals from there three times a day. So we'll always have good data uh, that's backed up. It maintains that file structure for us. So the folders, I can restore entire folders, entire, I could restore the entire domain if I needed to um, all at one point and it maintains those permissions for us. Um, same instance where with the ransomware, because this is now backing up those PDF files and things like that, that you don't have version history, it's creating another copy somewhere else that I can restore from. Um, so that's kind of where it'll go through and definitely ease the burden if we did need to use a restore point in some sort of a ransomware attack or um, malicious deletion or something like that. Um, and then it also will, all that data will be stored within the US, securely within the US, and they do go through and um, test their security on that on a yearly basis to make sure that there's no um, concern as far as intrusion to the, that data. And the cost for this would be $315 per month. So to put it in place for this year, the remainder of this year, it would be 945 And then starting next year, it'd be $3,780 per year. I have a program that I currently uh, had budgeted current for this year called Jump Cloud, which was a a cloud-based directory service with the Mosul MDM and the authentication services there that I have are in our MDM, I do not need that service any longer. So this would essentially become budget neutral for me uh, in years moving forward because I, what I'll be doing is just replacing that jump cloud service that I was paying for with this Backupify service. So with that, if anybody has any questions, I have one question. Yep. How often are you asked to recover documents? Not often. So I think um, I had one significant recovery that I had to do this year. But you, you kind of want to look up as your, uh, look at your backups as kind of like your insurance policy. You, you, you have to have it, and you hope you never have to use it. Because like where this is going to come in and where it's going to be a big issue is if you get hit with ransomware and it does connect to your Google Drive. So and then trying to restore everything that is out there would be a nightmare because you're doing it reversion. Ver, you have to rely on the version history at that point for those backup restor yep. restores from Vault. So three, $315 a month seems almost like too good to be true. I mean, is there other things that, I mean, is this the best of what you would say, this is what, what I really want? Are you saying this is good enough? No, I, this, from what I've looked at, this is <clears throat> definitely what I would want to have in place. It does a very good job. Um, I don't know, Joe, I believe you use this, correct? Yeah, I mean, we use it for, for the purpose that it serves, it's fine. I mean, it's, it's certainly not I wouldn't consider it security software. It's simply backup. Right. So, um, 
I'm also looking at the contract, and it shows a 40% discount that gets us to that $315 a month. Yep. Is that yep, they, sure they, for certain, forever? Yes. <laughs> yeah. They, they said the, they maintain those prices moving forward um, okay. continuously year after year. Okay. Any other questions with it? Do I have the okay to move forward with this? Uh, sounds like. So you would technically be approving the bill? Yep, it sounds good to me. Not tonight, obviously, when we would be, when you would get the bill. Right, but I can yeah, start we would sit on the bill. Don't we have to vote on the contract? The contract. Oh, okay. When we pay the bill. That's what well, the. the um, it's on there. Yeah. The contract is on there. I'm, I'm just, just saying because there is a contract, don't we have to vote on the Let contract? Let me just look at it quickly. Yeah. If it's a contract or if it's just an invoice. It is. So this will go on the um, board meeting. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Does this agreement include support for you, or is it relatively easy to? Pretty intuitive. I, okay. I don't. In, I mean, they'll definitely be there if I needed to call for additional support. But it's it's a pretty intuitive sure. system that is very easy to move around in. Okay. Chris, do you need a formal decision before our, our formal board meeting where we, we were where we can vote on it? No. Okay. It's I'll be all right. Like th that uh, contract was good until four one. Yeah, we th we're three sixteen is our next. Right, and what I would like to do, if it's all right, is to start the process. They do a thirty day uh, trial that would allow me to kind sure. of get it going get it. and have it in place, and then once we do that contract, um, get that sent back to them, and we'll already be up and running. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think at this time you, it's it's merely a formality. So right. All right. Thank you. All right. So now uh, on to E rate. Um, to give you an idea, like to background on what E rate is, is it's a federal program that subsidizes our internet service as well as internal connections for essentially getting the internet down to the classroom. So you you can. There's two different categories. Category one takes care of getting the internet to the building. So that would be the pipe coming from the IU to this building, and then the fiber going from this building out to our schools. Um, that all falls under category one, as well as our actual internet service. And then category two is for the internal connections. So, uh, we can use that for switches, access points, essentially the, the items that the device needs to utilize to get out to the internet. Um, so we can't use it for cameras, we can't use mm -hmm. it for those sort of items. It's strictly about getting internet down to the classroom. Um, so. With that, we have a category two budget that is based off of our student enrollment. They, they give a certain dollar amount per student that they allow to the school district and it's on a five year cycle. And right now our category two budget is $274,548. That is the total budget. That would include our percentage as well as what the subsidy from USAC would be um, for the E-rate e subsidy. The discounts are based off of your national school lunch uh, participation. So given what ours has been historically and what it continues to be, we fall in the 60% discount range. So of that $274,548, we would be responsible for 40% of that amount to exhaust our E-rate funds. Um, so with that, what I'm proposing to do is to have a project that will exhaust those funds in uh, starting for next year. I already put out for the PEPA mini bids uh, to do that. And what that would require is a commitment to spend uh, just about $110,000. Um, now, in working with Christine, we located money through the bond funding that we would 
would like to be able to put toward this to be able to fund that. And what that'll allow me to do is replace Wi-Fi throughout the district, except for the administration building, um, because we do not house students here. Uh, so I can't have the administration building Wi-Fi on that. But it will allow me to do that in the schools. And it will allow me to replace not all of the switches, but a good number of my switches within the district as well. Right now, the switches are 10 plus years um, for the majority of them. Some of them are a little less than that. Um, switch life, I would say seven to 10 years uh, is what the expectancy is. Uh, our switches are a bottleneck. Right now they can do one gig throughput through them. I would like to move up to 10 gig um, to kind of be able to expand for the future. Um, and then also replacing the Wi-Fi at the elementary building. Um, we did an E-rate project five years ago for Wi-Fi at the middle school and the high school. The elementary building ended up getting the Wi-Fi equipment that was in those buildings down to those buildings. So their, their systems are now 10 years old for the access points in the elementary buildings and for in the high school and middle school are at five years old, which is what I would say is a reasonable life for an access point. So that's kind of what I would like to move forward with. Um, and then ideally, I this is something I would have wanted to do and for future as far as for planning for refreshing in the future. Ideally, infrastructure, we can easily tie that right in with our refresh cycle of our devices. When we sell off the devices, if we take that equity that we have off of the devices and apply that toward the infrastructure, it'll be able to maintain itself without increasing my budget to budget for these things to be able to kind of build that in for these replacements. Chris, when we sold off the last ones to get mm -hmm. the, didn't we use that to buy the new computers though? No. no, it was used to offset budget gap for this current year. Okay. What's the, the window? This is like a five year window, right? What, what's yeah. the time frame for this? So this window, the current window goes out to 2025. Um, so doing it now, what that would line me up for is getting, I'm not going to get all of it, but I'll get the majority of my switches and stuff where I need to be and it will get me to a point that I shouldn't have any issue getting through to that next refresh. And then that'll also put us right at that time frame when we'll be re-upped again for our E-rate funding. And Chris and Christine, this is bond funding, so it's nothing that's in our budget currently. I mean, we don't have to worry about because it it's out of the bond funding, correct? Correct. This was uh, part of the discussion that we had, I think it was last month or maybe the month before. We must spend 85% of the 2019 A bond that we borrowed. I think it was for some work at the athletic field, mm -hmm. perhaps, and a, a variety of projects anyway. Um, right now, we need to, by October of 22, spend uh, approximately 210000 additional dollars to meet that 85% threshold uh, that's required to be spent within the three-year period. So uh, part of what another project was that Bill Rocket <coughs> talked about, the hot water, replacing the hot water, which we're working on for the high school. I think he was projecting that to be somewhere around 70,000. And so then this 110,000 would bring us up to 180. We would still have like, a, you know, about 30,000 that. And the requests are rolling in. Yeah. <laughs> Good. That's my next question. <laughs> oh, are I, there any other critical like in facility? I'm not saying this isn't critical, but I'm, I'm asking like, we, we were talking about other things like it's if we didn't do this if yeah right yeah i think um one of the reasons chris chris feels the need to do this is because we want to do it before we have any issues like our infrastructure is critical he feels like it's nearing the end of his life we utilize the money um to fill the budget deficit and we knew that we were going to have to 
do some minimum before the next um, Apple lease turnover again in four years. Um, um, I'm, I'm thinking, like, if Bill was sitting here, what would Bill say was more critical? I, I, I think he would be saying things like, you know, HVAC at the middle school and and um, yeah. the roof, those sort of big picture projects. Um, he's expressed a need for more cameras. Um, he's expressed a need for at the at the high school level um, the control the control panel for um, the lighting in the auditorium. Um, building leaders have expressed a need for um, vape sensors in the in the in the bathrooms, and, along with Bill Brackett. Um, so what I'm literally saying is, I said to Bill, like you you brought this up, and now the requests are rolling in. Um, and Ms. Deep had some thoughts about some needs for um, the wrestling room and. You know, I feel like I'm missing something. I don't mean to miss anybody's projects, but, you know, so, and not all of those projects would qualify for this funding. This qualifies, it's a need that we put off, and we want to make sure that we do it before we have any any issues. Chris, uh, what's the light? I'm oh, sorry. I would just add to that, the cameras, the sensors, those things do not work if my network isn't good. <laughs> because they all the go on The sensors don't work here. You, you can't pitch while just Bill's saying. not here to pitch. I'm just saying, like it, it all relies on my network. I think Joe wanted to say something. Chris, it, it well, works. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're in the midst of talking about possibly renovating. And that could be two years out, three years out. I don't know how long out. But say it does happen in three years. What is the, can you reuse the stuff? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, we can take it down off the wall or off the ceiling, move it to another classroom, put it up, as long as the cable's there. And if you're doing any kind of rebuilding or anything yeah. like that, cabling's gonna be part of that project. I think Joe wanted to say something. Yeah, I was just gonna add, for one, those vape sensors do not work, so I wouldn't ever advise wasting money on those. Um, but from, from Chris's standpoint, I, I understand his struggle. Uh, I think with our ongoing facility issue, and, and this isn't to say I, I don't support Chris, because I, I do, but when we're comparing some technology switches to possibly a roof, uh, my gut says the roof. Um, so I'm, I'm okay with it if the rest of the board is, 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 is as well, but you know, with facilities issues, I, wanna, I, I would kind of like to see a list of options um, and I don't want to kick the can down further, but is there something we get new switch gear, new wireless gear, whatever it is, but then we have a roof that needs to be replaced that we could have used this money for and we don't have the budget to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, those would be just the, off, off the top of my head, some thoughts. And I think we're talking about a couple, a couple hundred thousand dollars here as opposed to the cost, the full cost for the roof. Um, and, and also talking about not as I said, not all the projects would qualify for this. And the added bonus of taking advantage of the 40%, 60% um, E-rate funding that we wouldn't have for the roof. Well the, well, the discount's available through 2025. Yes. I guess, I guess to Joe's point, you know, we, we basically would be, would be, we would, we would be using up the, the bond fund if, if with this project. Is there anything else before we would say, yes, go forward with this? That we would, right. I mean, that's, that we want that's to, really that, that sure. we want to eliminate. Sure. Where we say go forward. I think that's a fair. Yeah. So we can we can come back together with Bill and um, you know come back to the board and provide an, an update of that. Yeah. And just to be clear. And I would, if I can, can I comment on one thing that Chris mentioned? Uh, I would. From I, I've been through this personally in my own employment, but so I feel I feel Chris's pain with some of this. Um, if as a board, I I mean I think we need to try our best to commit that, you know, the resell of that Apple equipment every four years, that if it's not all, we earmark a certain amount, because Chris did put some time and effort into creating a refresh plan that unfortunately kind of got hijacked because he didn't get what was kind of in his plan. So I, I understand where he's coming from, I guess. The only other thing that I would add is like uh, E-rate is very time sensitive. Um, so I have the bid out there. To, I'll have to evaluate everything. My bids are supposed to be due by um, Monday 
for that everybody to be back. So, and then I'd have time to evaluate the bids and stuff. But I would essentially need to bring a contract to you at the next meeting to be able to hit the deadlines for E rate for this year. Okay. Right. And if you don't hit the March 16th deadline, what what's the implication? You apply for it next year. March of next year. Well, yeah, or earlier. Or earlier January or earlier September. January, February is when okay. it usually opens. But um, yeah, if we have a roof failure, I, I just you know we've been through a repair with that prior. We're talking thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more. And if it's replacement, it's in the millions. So a hundred thousand dollars going here as opposed to elsewhere. Uh, you know, it, I, I, it isn't going to stop us from repairing the roof because uh, that's something we would have to do to get it done. But it'll be a major uh, capital improvement. Now, a hundred thousand would help, but it's not going to repair the roof by itself. If that's what you're concerned about, Joe. Yeah, I'm not. I just use that as an example. I just know we have facilities issues in every building, and yeah. you know what can this? I mean, I work in technology, so. My instinct is to, hey, let's let's do it. But, you know, we're looking at a one point eight million dollar gap with repairs that need to be done. You know, technology will likely keep running, although not ideal, but buildings may not. So um, yeah. if, if there's something more critical, I say, yeah, let, let Bill get back to us with that. But so, uh, the sense of urgency, with, you know, getting it this year, I mean, if the Internet goes out, and we have to replace the switches. It's going to have to come from somewhere. We got to spend this money by October. Yeah, I agree. But I mean, one switch drops and you drop, you know, five, eight grand on it. That's not a big deal. But I just just throwing it out there. Yep, sounds good. So in interest of meeting everybody's needs, we can reconvene with Bill. I can get something out in writing to the board. Um, we will bring the proposal to the March meeting and the board can decline the proposal at that time if, if that's the will of the board and um, go from there. Thank you, Chris, for doing this. Yeah, no problem, For operations today. All right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Next, we're going to go to policy. Mrs. Glenister. Yes. So I think we're reviewing um, three policy. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is the bullying and cyberbullying one. And we just made it's we're pretty much sticking with the same, but made a couple of changes. So it's in a number under bullying prevention procedures slash program. We made a change to number two, Can you open uh, where they added, and this one through the solicitor's office. Um, I'll wait till we can pull it up, maybe here on the screen, so everybody. Can I wanted to. I wanted to make sure that you could. Everybody can see the comments on it. Right. Oh. Okay. So Kelly, would you please share? I think this one has to stop. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Coming, coming, coming. You wait till it comes up on the screen there. Keep okay. It's yes, I know. <laughs> these these are not long policy discussions. Yes. So we're just changing and adding in section number two uh, to add when a student's behavior indicates a threat to the safety of the student, other students, school employees, school facilities, the community, or others. District staff shall report the student to the threat assessment team in accordance with applicable law and board policy. Under number three, we are taking out a sentence, so it's just going to read the building principal or his or her designee will investigate the alleged conduct that occurred. And number four, we are changing the last sentence to uh, say where the alleged bullying occurred off campus and not at a school sponsored function, the building principal may refer to the school resource officer. So I think those were the only changes. I know that uh, Mrs. McKelvey had a question about that. It, and this might actually be addressed in a different policy, so you're the person to ask, right? Um, with the definitions in bullying, does that include if sexted pictures are shared with students for whom they were not intended? I know that's, you know, I, I would consider that bullying, but it doesn't appear in my reading to be covered by that definition. 
So the differentiator would be bullying is intended to be, you know, ongoing, uh, continuous. It becomes more pervasive. It's not a one-time Snapchat and send the photo. So that would actually be covered under under inappropriate behavior. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. I was just thinking, is, is sexting good for any of these people? Probably not. That's probably. <laughs> and probably these recommendations were made by um, our attorney, so right. um, we talked through why and and what her references were. Okay. Then the second policy is Board Policy Five A point eight, which is disciplinary procedures for district employees, and we've just changed a couple of the wording there. Um, basically to add superintendent or designee under progressive discipline on number two, three, and four, um, and five. And I think that was because, Lynn, you're not sure you can always be available, right? Correct. And some of the other policies have superintendent or designee. Um, if the board wants to be more specific about designee, we could include, you know, superintendent, assistant superintendent, or coordinator of HR, and that would still meet the same purpose. If, in theory, everybody agrees to that, we can update this and have it, have it ready for the um, yeah. final publishing. If you don't like, the, if if designee feels too broad, I, I feel like especially in this particular area, it's a bit broad. Just you know, I, because if I, I don't know, I, I can just foresee an issue where then you get you know wrongful termination suit back, you know, because. We didn't specify, you know, they, they felt, and honest, this is nothing to say, I trust you to choose an appropriate designee. It's not that. It's just c kind of covering all our bases. It seems like an easy I don't. Fix. I don't have any concerns with making that change. And we could, and we could run that by Christine also, right, to see. We can. 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 Yeah, I mean, I probably wouldn't because I don't want to pay them. Yeah, right. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ask her when she's at a meeting. Yeah. Christine said that this would cover us as well, though, right? Most of our policies have or designee, but I under, I understand Laura's perspective. Like, it, and it's not you're not writing the policy just for me too. You're writing for whomever is superintendent and whatever board is enforcing it. Yeah. Okay. So I'll make those adjustments to that particular policy. And then the the last one is uh, policy five e point one. And that's the health examination and screenings. And we just made a change at the very end saying that um, written statements relating to this should be provided directly to the Human Resources Department. And that was a change so that it wasn't going through other personnel. It wasn't going to building leaders. Right. Like for the health, and health information. Like a, a privacy issue, right? Yes, exactly. OK, that's it, I believe. That's it. So we'll bring those. Um, We'll remove the comments, clean it up, and bring them for final reading and approval in the March um, board meeting. OK. Thank you, everyone. Um, any old business? And I would like to alert you that it's 1024 PM. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, next meeting is Wednesday, April 6th. And uh, I adjourn this meeting. Thank, thank you, everybody. everybody. And thanks. Thank Take you care. to our um, live viewers. I see there are some of you still with us. So thank you for taking the time. We do appreciate it.